Ready. Play. But we will go in French. Uh, let's do English first and then we'll do French at the end. You're just, hi, Michelle Coffin from the Miami Herald. Welcome to Miami. <laughs> I know you're a Miami person too. Uh, can you just talk about uh, how you feel playing out there? You know, what, what keeps you going after so many years and how do you feel playing out here tonight? You know, I felt great. It was the first time I played uh, in the stadium, so you know, I was really happy with experience. Like session is exactly when, uh, when I like to play. It was a great match. The guy played good, so you know, it was good. I'm still playing for, for those moments, you know, for those challenges. Um, I feel like he is a couple months. Uh, um, my body uh, let me, uh, let me, you know, to, to improve a little bit and uh, to be better. And, uh, and I feel like um, this fire is still there. So I'm just, I'm still enjoying on the court. So I try to enjoy it as much as I can. Thank you. you had success of ATP 1000 before. This is obviously one of them. Um, the fire you mentioned is still there. The drive, obviously, to be successful at this tournament. How is it for you? Yeah, of course, you know, uh, I feel like uh, my, my, my game has started to be a bit stronger. My, uh, I always say a good player is the one who has a, a very high average um, level uh, daily. And, uh, and I feel like uh, my daily level is, is increasing. Uh, I feel like uh, then my movement is better. I feel that um, I'm going more for my shots. Um, Everybody around me tell me I'm still young, so I can I can push. And uh, honestly, uh, I trust them. I see myself moving um, quite fast on the court. I'm happy with that. So why not play? Uh, why not try to uh, to play tough on the on the, on the big tournament and big events? So slowly, uh, slowly, you know, I want to improve my ranking to be uh, to be able to be seeded, uh, have uh, less matches, maybe also not uh, clash uh, big players right away, so that's a, that's a, that's a little step, but uh, I start to do the matches. You had a couple of great points there, a little, you know, you're a little bit of a showman. Do you plan for those crazy I shots? I, <laughs> I wish you... I could, you know, but uh, there's always no plan. It's, uh, it's, it's impossible to plan because you never know, you know, what type of shot you will have. Uh, you never know the moment. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, I always say it's, it's quite natural. And, and most of them, to be honest, is to win the points. So they look a little bit different, but uh, sometimes it's because I feel like we're more comfortable uh, jumping or sliding or whatever, you know, the, like even uh, with no, no look. Sometimes people think like the no look is so much easier for me than to look at the ball. So, you know, it's a, it's a mix of both. Physically, like, is this as good a shape you've been in for quite a while, do you feel? Yeah, because uh, I was uh, not even walking last year. Yeah. Last year, yeah, I, I was. Uh, it was terrible. You know, it yeah. was terrible. So of course, it's been. Uh, it's been a year. I was battling to, to get back to this, uh, this shape, and, uh, and and I'm happy with that. It was not the best, but uh, better. Yeah. Your career has spanned, you know, the the Rafa, Djokovic, Nadal, you know, and Federer, and now you have these young guys. How, how would you say, what, what do you think about this new group of guys compared to the other group? You've seen all of these players around you. For me, they are great, you know, they are great. Um, they are great champions. Uh, they, they're building like uh, a new era of tennis and uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm super happy, you know, to, to, to challenge them, to, to be able to play with them and uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, to call them legend as the, the three dimension, you know, we need, uh, we need, they need time, they need uh, Win uh, year after year as uh, as those guys have done it, but uh, so far they're building a uh, great rivality, um, great tennis, and uh, I feel like uh, you know it's a, it's a great area to come into. If I could ask one more about about Elena and what she's doing in Ukraine while she's a playing at a high level, b a mother, and c being such a, a force in, in in Ukraine, can you just talk about her and? How if she an inspiration I will, I, to you? I will, I will shift it a little bit. A, be a great mother first, you know. That's that's first, you know. People want to put tennis first, but you know, I think uh, she's a great mother first, you know. That's that's the A one. 
and this is uh, this is this is you know the most important for me you know as a husband you know because of course we are a tennis couple but you know the life it's uh, it's uh, beyond of uh, of uh, our sport so she's a excellent and great mother and as you say she managed it well you know on the court uh, I'm the first surprise you know how well you know she came back as strong she is uh, mentally you know and uh, and physically you know it's, uh, it's just amazing you know I can't really tell you so much because even me I'm amazed and of course with uh, the Ukraine situation is is even uh, crazy you know uh, with everything that uh, she puts uh, you know for our country um, through herself you know and, uh, and to be able to uh, to manage, um, let's say all of three, but there's many others. But let's say all of three. You know, we keep it short. It's uh, it's just amazing, and uh, um, she is a she is a tough woman. Can you talk about the uh, first set? It was back and forth the whole time. Obviously, it went to a tiebreaker. Can you just talk about you know what went into that, and then you came back also from that tiebreaker. You were down. You know, first set here yeah, was not easy, but uh, I had the lead with my serve. I felt like uh, he had no opportunity on my service game. Uh, I think I won't drop so many points. I need to check, but I haven't dropped so many points on my serve. So I was quite confident on my service game, and he was about to 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 find you know my reach uh, to his uh, to his uh, service game. And then in the breaker, his couple point in there, I was a little bit uh, tough on him. Mm -hmm. uh, it was long rallies. Then he went for two uh, shot maybe because I think he was a bit tired and. Uh, yeah, then uh, you know how it is, tennis is quick, and I've just been tough on that. Um, when, uh, you mentioned the fire, like you're still in great shape. You plan to play Olympics, I mean, in your country? I, I wish, you know, I, I hope to qualify myself, you know, I need to qualify first, and uh, that's definitely, as I say, for more than a year when I came back, that, that, that was the goal to qualify for the Olympics, I need to qualify myself, and if I qualify, of course, I will have a player. What are your expectations for me to have friends? Games. My expectation is to qualify myself. I hope you know. I hope you know that to qualify. But uh, it will be great. You know, it's been 100 years we haven't uh, you know host the Olympics. Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, it's something special for, for French people. So you know, if if I get the chance to to play there, I'll be tough.
ready. Play. Señores, se quiso lo que va a pasar si lo llamado el campo. his game when the big occasions come up. So he has to be one of the top favorites. I truly believe um, we had a podcast ourselves yesterday, which I do with Patrick Kunin called Mad Dog and Wingman. And we spoke about okay. that obviously as well, the outlook. And I picked Carlos Alcaraz as the winner this year. Um, just because he won just his first title on grass. I think he is extremely, um, in a way, extremely able to adapt to situations and to challenges, not just because he has the game, just because he is, he's loving it. You know, he loves it to, to challenge himself. And um, I think he has learned a lot of plays. When you look back at the French Open semifinals against Novak, his breakdown, his physical and mental breakdown, with a lot of players, you would say like, well, they would struggle with that for the next weeks and months to come. I think with Alcaraz, he has learned a huge lesson from that match and it will never happen again to him. I think it made him even stronger and a better player. And that's why I really feel like he believes he can Wimbledon and he wants to prove to the world that that was a one-off and it's not going to happen again. And I think if you would look at it and he would be honest, maybe he would say like, I want to play the final against Novak and I want to prove to the people that's not going to happen again and I'm able to win this. So my pick really is Carlos Alcaraz. I know we're coming to the end now, Marco, but I have got one more point.
Um, hi, Novak. Um, I don't know if you saw what Vasek said uh, last night about uh, organising and, and, and tennis could and should be even bigger than it already is if only the people organising it were doing their job properly. He highlighted the balls, he highlighted playing late at night and then early in the morning and injuries. I just wondered whether you heard that but also if you'd like to add something. Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't heard that. Um, I actually saw Vasek just... <laughs> before I came here to, to, to see you guys, but I haven't, I haven't seen his statement on that. But there's been a lot of discussions on, um, on the effect of the different balls in every, basically every week uh, on the, the joints and the wrist and the shoulders and the elbows. And, uh, you know, I think someone told me that in terms of injuries, um, this year comparing to other years is, you know, drastically has gone up. So um, yeah, in terms of the balls, I absolutely agree. There should be there should be some discussion on that. I actually spoke about uh, that with uh, Andrea Gaudenzi, the ATP president, and Massimo, who is the CEO, uh, in Paris during Paris Bercy Week. And you know, I, I shared my opinion and my views. And then you know, obviously, they are thinking about various different options and ways of how to regulate that and how to make it. Uh, uh, better for the players and prevent prevent injuries. Uh, in terms of the scheduling, I think you know there has been a lot of criticism and a lot of um, yeah, basically um, uh, um, player players complaining about it. So I think that should be addressed in a proper way. Obviously, Davis Cup and ITF is regulated differently from ATP Tour. And from Grand Slams, you have different governing bodies, different schedules, different broadcasting demands in the end of the day we know that the TV is the one deciding fortunately or unfortunately but you know there, there has to be more I guess thorough discussions on that as well. I didn't play my tennis tonight, um, but on the other hand, I was there to win it, you know. So uh, for sure, I didn't, didn't, you know, live up to my standard as um, as I usually do. So I'm not happy. But on the other hand, like these two weeks were so intense that you just have to look forward, and it doesn't matter now.
Hello guys, so apparently I am Thiago, uh, um, Sabovilt is my guy, so I am going to be on, on the deck for this one, yes. Uh, first time I heard this, but okay, if you think that, yes, your theory sort of is justified because of me calling this match. However, we kind of chose the worst court, because indeed there's a Lance Davis wannabe on this court, just um, Taylor did not like how slick it was. Someone I read on Twitter said that it was because there's like more airflow on the outside courts rather than, you know, Hard Rock Stadium and the, the main arena. So that, that makes a lot of sense, of course. And uh, basically the outside courts dried a bit faster. Uh, so for now, we are going to watch for a little while. We're going to watch Tommy Paul against Martin Dam. See if the big serving lefty whose dad was a runner-up at the doubles event here in Miami twice back in 2000 to 2007 can threaten Tommy or not. Right now he hits a double fault to go 15-40 down. And then the moment we will have Thiago Sebovit and uh, Taylor Fritz uh, playing, we will be uh, there. Terry says that players are going off court as well. So, uh, well, we'll see. I mean, if, if it's like a long delay, maybe we'll just watch Paul Dunn. Uh, let's see how uh, how that how long that uh, thing goes. But I think it's been like 15 minutes more or less since James Blake was called onto the court. Fergus Murphy was on his on his walkie-talkie, and um, yeah, eventually someone came. He waved to the camera as well, so that's why I said Lance Davis wannabe. He clearly wanted to sort of have that sort of fame as well, but I don't think he's gonna get it. And um, yeah, for now, let's see if Martin Dunn can hold here. He is breakpoint down. And uh, here's the first crack from his base end game. I mean, I'm assuming that there was more. I only tuned into the match at 15.30 in this game. So I'm assuming that there were probably more cracks. But yeah, he's just unable to keep up the trade here. Uh, but, um, lefty forehand cross at the Tommy Paul backhand. Tries to switch down the line, I think, at least. Because, yeah, it was just a total shank. So there's an early break coming Tommy's way. Personally, I don't think that uh, Dan will have a good time in this match. He will like have to just straight up serve his way into the tie breaks. But uh, that's kind of the only possible thing for him. Otherwise, the return, the athleticism of Tommy, yeah, it's, a, it's a tough one. Especially outdoors. If they were playing indoors, maybe. Uh, left ankle injury of Tommy Paul in uh, Indian Wells. Uh, yeah, I don't know. This is, of course, his first match. So far, he is looking pretty good. Why is Fritz being delayed? Uh, I'd have to see. I'd have to say, I mean, this is uh, kind of basically the fact that they went on, went out onto the court. It turned out that it was still a little too slick. Uh, Fritz was afraid to play, I think, for the most part. I don't think it was save of it, but Fritz... He called James Blake. James Blake ordered this guy to come over with the vacuum cleaner. And yeah, basically they are still preparing the court. Apparently it will take a while. Not going to disagree with what Ghosty said either. I like the American public school system shaming. That's, that's definitely something I enjoy. Recently, I, def I went a bit hard at a friend of mine who was, well, um, his geography knowledge was not up to par, let's, let's say that. And uh, I do think that it was because of the American school system. Anyway, Tommy Paul serving it 2-1, as for now we are watching that match instead of Sabre Field Fritz. Initially, we actually wanted to cover this match. However, then I sort of noticed, you know, as the... Uh, rain delays and all the schedule changes came in. I sort of noticed that Sabo Wild Fritz are in a similar slot. And uh, basically that seemed like a maybe more, I don't know if even more interesting, but certainly like, you know, bigger names and bigger story possible. Uh, but, um, well, for now we're back to Tommy Paul against Martin Dam. And since there's an early break for Tommy already, it's kind of hard to see Dam producing a comeback in this set. We'll see. The baseline game, uh, the, the baseline edge here is absolutely massive. Martin, of course, so uh, I don't want to call him a serve bot. I don't think he is either. But, you know, he's kind of an all or nothing game style on off the ground. And in the opening ground, he was able to handle it well. He was able to sort of produce the right stuff at the right moment, find that crazy pass to set up triple match point. 
it was all cool, but um, I don't know if Tommy is going to give him that opportunity. And especially if he gets a lot of returns in, it will be hard for Martin to take over. But, you know, going forwards, I do think that Dump probably will be a top 100 player at some point. The weaponry is just too big, but he's not turning out to be what we thought when he was playing juniors and sort of didn't even play all that much. Still got to number four, I think, in the IT rankings. But yeah, basically, right away, he was just perceived as a massive, massive talent. I guess that's what happens with tall big hitting lefties that's kind of i know everyone is already expecting a lot from you and probably rightfully so especially with that sort of tennis background as well the best of both worlds in a way between the states and the czech republic both countries he's been uh, sort of you know part of their their system if you may img for many many years uh, which is why of course he's getting the wild cards Past two years, I think, was just qualifying in Miami this time, the main draw, and of course, he's already used it well, winning the match. Um, but yeah, he's been signed with IMG for many, many years, and as a kid, he trained a lot in the Czech Republic as well. Still has a, yeah, he has a Czech coach, he's an American coach, basically, tra traveling with a couple of people. Jan Schatra, the, the main name there in his box, former 136, I think, maybe, something like that, anyway. Um, husband of Denis Sartova as well, so a lot of tennis connections there, but apparently Dam and Shatral at the very beginning of Martin's career, the very beginning of Martin's life even, were training at the same club, so they've kind of known each other since he was a kid. And uh, yeah, one three down here, let's see if he can keep going and try to just hold on until maybe Tommy makes a mistake. It's a laughable second serve. I mean, no way you're going to get that ever. And Dan does go for his second serve a lot. Um, I wouldn't say every single time, but yeah, he's going to produce a fair amount of double faults, but of course also a lot of aces. And the spin on that as well, that's, that's kind of unreachable. I think this one is also an ace. Yes, indeed. Onto line with insane with an insane angle. And that's game for uh, Martin Dam. Um, a lot of talk in the chat. Did I miss anything? Important. <laughs> this tourney is turning out to be a scheduling nightmare for the players. Hopefully they can get a lot of matches done today. I mean, yeah, thankfully, uh, it seems like we should be pretty much clear for the rest of the evening. It's just a shame that Seipo, Vita and Fritz still haven't been able to come onto court. And I guess Kefir Baez as well. Um is that is is center not the only court that's been delayed, or is Kepfer Bias actually after something and it's just flash court? Now Kepfer Bias also haven't started on court six, for whatever reason. But yeah, otherwise we have a lot of matches already. Leila Fernandez playing Emiliana Arango, Lin Zhu against Jessica Pegula up an early break. We also have Talon Greek Sport against Alex Mikkelsen, just beginning. Um, Nicholas Jari, Jack Draper, and Chris O'Connell against Francis Tiafo. Basically, Paul Dam was the match that started the earliest. She took issue. I don't even understand what you guys are talking about, so I'm just going to leave that be. And uh, how do I know all this stuff I, about them, I guess? I mean, you know, I follow these guys, I guess. Uh, I've interviewed him as well. 
uh, in uh, Koblenz actually just just a month ago, oh, a bit over a month ago. Estoril is on the chopping block. However, it's the only event, it's the only 250 that they mentioned in the whole announcement, uh, basically. So uh, you've got like five 250s that are scrapped, but they only mentioned Estoril out of that. And it seems like they're working on something to like either include it in the calendar somewhere or maybe just have it, you know, as a big challenger someplace. But um, you know, personally, I, I haven't been to the event, which I'm actually going to change in like 10 days. But what I'm uh, going to say is that if you are sort of ousted by Bucharest out of your usual spot, then, yeah, I mean, kind of your position wasn't strong enough to begin with. I mean, Bucharest is what just, uh, well, it's a, not a new event. It's a returning event, but it's like Tiriak money and only really that. You also have Marrakesh in that same spot, and Marrakesh is staying, Ashtori isn't. I guess it's for the ATP to sort of show us that they are keeping tennis in Africa, right? Like, we have an African event. You can't say that tennis isn't global, that it isn't worldwide. So I guess that's why Marrakesh is staying instead of Ashtori. But I guess it says something, at least, that they mentioned it, and they didn't mention you know, Lyon. Newport, Atlanta, all that stuff. Like they don't care about these events, but the story was part of the announcement. Like they mentioned that, you know, of course, they know that an event like this is, you know, uh, a thing, and they, that they want to keep it going. They just don't know where yet. I mean, on the honestly, right now, the only way you, to feed it in the calendar would be to go in uh, the Barcelona Munich win uh, week, right? I don't know if the ATP wants to do it because there are two 500s already in that week. So maybe that's the, the plan sort of for them. Maybe they just don't want to have a third event in that spot. But I think that's really the only way for that to happen. Of course, also for many, many years, we've been flirting around with the idea to have 250s in the second week of Miami or second week of any two week events, really. So far, uh, they kind of didn't want to do it. They also introduced the Challenger 175s. Of course, not in Miami second week. I don't know if a 250 in the story could really work because Miami, I mean, as we see, I mean, on the weekend, so many players are still here, right? So I don't know if they would be able to get to a story in time. I don't know if they would want to get to a story in time even. I would probably say that only Barcelona Munich week is the only uh, way to go. Martin Dam actually putting in a few returns here, and Tommy Paul cracks on this baseline, uh, sorry, on this backhand cross court. But this was a, a takeable opportunity for uh, the youngster for sure. Gets the second serve from Paul, tries to uh, tries to attack it and instantly approach, but nets it over. Uh, yeah, basically nets it down the line. There's some puns coming from Sean as usual. About Martin being damned. And uh, Martin is kind of damned by with uh, you know after he misses this shot as well. Wasn't anything crazy from Tommy on the two breakpoint saves, but this time he plays the shot that he missed a couple of points ago very well. Just good depth at the down forehand. There's a shank from the American from the young American's racket, and uh, we are a deuce. So Tommy has saved the two breakpoints. I'm not really taking his opportunities when he had them. Can he produce one more? Well, that was a bit lucky for Paul. But this back it doesn't go over the net. So the first one had like zero net clearance. It clipped the tape. The second one doesn't even go over. So a lot of a lot of errors here in this game from Tommy Paul off the ground. So if there's going to be an opportunity for them to break back, maybe that is it. Let's see, third break point already. Paul approaching the net, and it's going to be an easy cleanup for him. Smart play, so that Dam is going to have to lift the return. Approaches, has an easy put away.
Does table tennis have much TV coverage? I only see it at the Olympics. Um, in Poland, there's a bit of TV coverage. I would say, though, it's mostly the league rather than um, individual competitions. Like, in terms of online streaming, yeah, you can watch it with commentary. It's, it's of course, not as huge as uh tennis i believe that's basically for most events it's kind of like the world feed and that's it at least you know in terms of you know the international let's say broadcasts maybe there are more in like countries that are just more invested in the sport like i don't know china of course i would assume that there's a lot of broadcasts maybe even like germany i don't know or maybe john can tell us sometime but but in poland it's mostly going to be uh, the olympics and the uh blah, blah, blah. And of course, uh, that the Polish league as well has some broadcasts. I've watched a couple of matches uh, recently. Actually, it's uh, you know, I'm I'm not that familiar with most of the players, honestly. But uh, from time to time, I can sort of see on, on TV someone that I played like five or six years ago, and it's you know, it's it's a pretty fun feeling. Um, there's there's this guy who basically plays for like one of the best teams in Poland right now and he totally crushed me twice in high school but you know it's a story I can tell people right that are watching with me <laughs> hey, hey I played this guy doesn't matter that I had zero chances of winning uh... I don't understand uh, the deal about my pronunciation of story. That's how I say it. I have no idea if that's that's how it's supposed to be said or not. But I think Ghosty, you're also not uh, probably not the best expert sort of on Portuguese pronunciation. So I'd assume that um, you're not the guy I should be learning from. Uh, you're glad that I'm not bitter about it. I mean, I can't be bitter about it because I never really, you know had a shot, never really had an attempt. So no, I, I can't be bitter about it, basically. I, I started way too late for, for, I don't know if I would be able to, like, you know, if I have some talent or not, I don't really know. I never tried, so I can't be bitter. But yeah, obviously, if it was, if it was different, if it was like, you know, me hardcore trying and these guys make it, I don't, yeah, that would be frustrating, absolutely. Yeah, pickleball, I don't think you're going to find a single broadcast in Poland, but badminton actually is sometimes on TV. Martin down with an ace here, 3-4 down now. Still, that early break is holding for Tommy, but of course, the previous service game that he had it was very tough. Free break points saved, lots of just like... Yeah, first two free shots of the rally that he was missing, especially backhands cross, but he survived that, so that might end up being extremely vital for the rest of the set. I mean, at this stage, honestly, we can kind of change the name of the live stream, I think, <laughs> because it, do it doesn't seem like Tommy Pot, Taylor Fritz, and Tiago Sable Beat will be on court anytime soon. <laughs> Maybe not ever. I mean, Dominic Kepfer and um, Sebastian Baez already, uh, you know, then there's been a coin toss. We know that Kepfer will be serving. Sable Beat and Taylor Fritz, who the hell knows? So, um, well, basically, I think Tommy Paul and Martin Dahm will be the focus for some time at least. It, that's what it seems. Yes, Ashley, that will be fun. Both me and John going to Astoria. My first ATP, ATP main tour event in quite some time. But, you know, you got to go once a year or something. I will have to, like, do a cleanse after that, you know, go to rehab and travel to a challenger sometime soon after that. But for now, I can visit a, a major event every once in a while. And, yeah, let's see if Tommy keeps having some issues or not because the, the previous game, as we said, it just wasn't clean at all. He gave them the opportunity to maybe return into to maybe return to this match, you know, to maybe get something going. Dam didn't quite take it, so 
for now we are still a break ahead for the more experienced American for the veteran for the favorite veteran maybe is of course a stretch talking about Tommy Paul for now but he's a veteran compared to Martin Dam who's just starting his main tour career he actually had his first main tour win this week and I think this was also his first main tour match because previously I think that was only getting qualies wildcards to Miami qualies wildcards to the US Open never qualified also he played qualifying at an indoor event earlier this year um I don't remember if it was Marseille or Montpellier but basically he lost to Cressy in the final qualifying round I think it must have been Marseille because Montpellier week that was maybe no Montpellier no, maybe it was actually Montpellier. Uh, never mind. Anyway, Montpellier or Marseille, one of these, he uh, was trying to qualify and didn't make it. So uh, his first round win here in Miami was also his first main tour match, first main tour win. Now he's trying to sort of break a, yet another milestone, right? Because, yeah, the first top 20 win and all that stuff, it would be pretty massive for Martin to get it done, but we will see if he can threaten Tony now. Um, I actually wonder how many top 100 wins, you know, Martin Dunn might have because it's it's not going to be much. Uh, I wonder if this one against Jiren Zhang actually wasn't the first one or am I forgetting about something? Yeah, it, it, that was actually the first one. It was only his third match against the top 100 opponent as well. The previous ones being against Federico Coria at US Open qualifying and also Champagne last year against Alex Mikkelsen. Ah, that was the one where they had like this rally. Um, it was like eight shots and they hit three winners in that. Um, I don't know if it was spectacular tennis because like, you know, there was no pace really. It was actually like pretty simple to winners if you may, but you know, still it was a fun occurrence, I guess. And uh, yeah, and here he beat Jiren Zhang, number 49 in the world. 1530 again, just putting some better returns in, and Tommy is cracking a little bit on these first shots. Once again, sort of just like struggling with the first strike, the first two, three shots of the rally. Uh, but he gets a nice serve at the body here, probably a good idea against Dam a lot of the time, given how Martin is, of course, a very tall player and can be kind of clunky. And again, there's there's a lot that's clunky about this return. Tommy going at the body, just hunting that direction. This could be a real play for him going forwards in this match too, because he's been burned by a few returns where Dam is pretty close to the baseline. And there's like not much time for to recover for Tommy. But uh, I mean, when he's serving at the body, that's this isn't happening really. And once again, that's that's the play. I mean, th there's no real like you know placement angle on the Tommy Paul serve, but it's just good pace down the middle, and it's bringing him the points from 15:30. Basically, three serves like this in a row, and three points coming his way. So, five free after 31 minutes for the whatever seed. I want to say 12, but it's actually 13th. was definitely a good idea to start watching this instead of Fried Sable Build. <laughs> that I can tell you. As even Kepfer and Baez are on court by now, still no mention of Sable Build and Fritz. Jasmine Paulini, in the meantime, first winner today, defeating Katie Volinets. Obviously, this was not a match that was fully contested today. So it was just uh, Jasmine. Oh, actually, was it? No, wait. Was it? No, no, that's impossible, right? Yeah, of course it wasn't, yeah. They, they basically just wrap things up. Uh, in this order of play that I have here from the ATP, I don't think they mentioned that this was a match that was to be finished. However, it definitely must have been. Is it mentioned on the overall? Yeah, it's it's actually also not mentioned on the overall order of play that I have here. But anyway, yeah, it was, of course, a, a match that had to be finished. Uh... <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm gonna cry over KT for minutes, but Mario is a happy guy right now. So I'm talking about badminton. I've played like twice in my life. It's very hard to sort of drop some tennis antics. You just try to hit regular, you know, full motion forehands and there you just kind of have to pick up the ball. Also, the serving is very tough. Like if you're playing against someone who's good, most of your serves can be just smashed away sometimes. But, you know, it was fun. Definitely a good exercise in terms of like flexibility and stuff. Maybe a better option if you're older than uh, tennis as well. Once you maybe can't cover the court as efficiently, but who knows, we'll see. Great down, back and down the line here from Dam. Looks like he will be able to just get that fourth game on the board and potentially pose some trouble later on. Tommy Paul could afford to improve his second serve, says Ghosty. I noticed that Medi, who is very observant and clever, quickly figured out how to come in and take it off the bounce and beat Paul's serve. Yeah, Medi definitely a, a player who's going to adjust mid-match if he sees anything that he can exploit. And of course, it was a match that kind of he needed that in because, well, he was down early. He had to come up with something right away. That's a pretty horrific volley miss here from Dom, but maybe it's not gonna matter. He's still 40-30. The Dom volleying is a is a story also that can be sort of talked about for ages because sometimes he's just Fantastic. Sometimes he's hitting the softest, you know, softest drop volleys everywhere. And then he has like this absolutely terrible put away that makes you question how is he over two meters tall with such a big serve and hasn't like developed his net game more. But I think he's, you know, on the way also in this regard. Yeah, let's see if Tommy Paul can serve out now. And um, yeah, we'll also maybe start um, noticing the Tommy Paul second serve and how dumb approaches it after Ghosty's comment. Uh, there was definitely an opportunity for them earlier when there was a second serve on breakpoint. And he tried, you know, he tried to go down the line after that, but he didn't really make that, so. Sorry, just hit the reply. How do nations determine these Olympic representation? Is it just a ranking thing? Okay, so this is a pretty big topic. Uh, basically, you have 56 direct acceptances from the ranking list. However, uh, you can only have four different, uh, four players from each committee, basically, from each country. Um, there's also other ways to get in. Two spots are reserved for like slam champions or Olympic medalists from the past or something like that. And also you have the uh, African Games, the Asian Games, the Pan American Games, basically all of these like intercontinental competitions as well that can get you into the Olympics if you win them. However, you need to be in the top 400 uh, at the cutoff in order to, to get these places. And also, uh, if your country already has four players in, you might not get in anyway. So, for example, if Facundo Diaz Acosta isn't in the top four of Argentines at the uh, at the cutoff date, he's not going to get in based on his Pan American Games uh, title, gold medal. So, mostly it's going to be a ranking list. Yes, 56. But after that, it's like a bit of a mess. And sometimes players can just, you know, join regardless. Also, there's this uh, qualification criteria, which basically uh, makes you um, only um, eligible for this if you've played two Davis Cup rubbers since the previous Olympics, 
well, to, to Davis Cup ties, let's say, since the previous Olympics. And one of them has to be this year or the previous year. So that's why we had a lot of players, for example, like, oh, Iga Świątek is playing against Switzerland soon because she has to fulfill that Olympic qualification criteria. That's, of course, not the Davis Cup in that case, but the Fed, uh, Beijing King Cup, but, you know, it's the same. Uh, Hubert Hurkacz this year and last year, actually, as well, he had to play two consecutive ties for Poland against Barbados in September. And this year, of course, against Uzbekistan, because he also needed to fulfill the criteria. But first and foremost, it is the ranking list, yes. 56 out of 64 entries are just direct acceptances. Has Martin Dam landed this passing shot based on his reaction? I don't think he has. He's doing a fine attempt trying to uh, make to make it tough for Tommy in the net here. First point of the game, he actually won like this. He makes Tommy stretch for a forehand volley, which doesn't go over. Here, he had that open space, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that easy. But he just barely misses it, this, this backhand cross-court pass. So it's 30-15 for Tommy. And uh, yeah, I guess that's really it for the Olympics. Um, it's a little complicated, but first and foremost, it is the ranking, yes. The, the nations don't, don't really get to decide. There's no, uh, there's no decisions in the committee. It's, it's just what the player has achieved. All the, all the potential decisions are from the, uh, you know, if, if we're talking about the Grand Slam places and stuff, these champions, you know, the two reserved places for them, it's only going to be up to the IOC. International Olympic Committee. Uh, it's not going to be up up to the country. No, no. There's no there's no decisions like that there. So, for example, last week we had the African Games, and uh, they were won. Well, this week actually, and they were won by Moes Ekargui from Tunisia, who uh, is in the top 400, and I think he's like almost guaranteed to be in the top 400 by the cutoff date. So he will actually make the Olympics based on that. Uh, four years ago, it was Mohamed Safbat from Egypt who made it based on that criteria. In uh, in the women's uh, singles at the African and the African Games, it was Angela Okutoni, the Kenyan uh, youngster, who won it. However, she's currently not in the top 400, so she will need to uh, win. But these are all these other, you know, less important spots. Let's say 56 are based on the ranking, but let but remember that there are only four spots per country. Whew, some wild forehands here from Tommy, but it was at 40 30, so it's just deuce. But you know, from, from point away from the set, Nam now has another small opportunity to break. Why is Davis Cup a factor? Uh, well, it's both ITF organized, you know, the Davis Cup and the Olympics. Um, so yeah, for, for men, for women, yeah, there's also a lot of. Uh, doubles rules, but uh, honestly, I won't get into that because I don't really know them by heart. But basically, you have this thing where, like, if you're in the top 10, you can choose a partner from whatever ranking range. Like, you can just take whoever you want. But if you are taking someone from, if you're someone from outside the top 10, then you're just sort of signing up as a pair and there's a ranking list. And there's all, there also can be just two pairs per. Uh, country. I actually think they might have even changed that for just one pairing. I don't even remember. Anyway, last last uh, last Olympics in Tokyo, right? We had a mixed doubles final between two Russian pairings. Uh, Pavlyuchekova with uh, Rublev, was it? And Vesnina Karatsev, I think. But yeah, basically in singles, it's four men for women. Yeah, yeah. Um, why is Davis Cup a factor? Yeah, I guess it's just, you know, very similar. ITF nationality is involved and stuff, no points. Uh, Martin Dam doesn't take that opportunity, getting to deuce uh, just a couple of missed returns. He was trying to go hard at the middle here, but indeed he just sort of, you know, the ball ends up just getting launched straight at Tommy, who has to dodge it even, but, you know, it didn't give him anything. So Nadal gets in based on his slam record because he's ranked hella low right now. It is very possible that Nadal will be one of the players who will get that um, final spot, if you may. Um, yes, it, it is possible that they will give it to him, but it's like very unclear. He also hasn't played Davis Cup in a while, uh, but I don't know if that really matters. Like, yeah, some of that process is very complicated. <laughs> and uh, with Russia, which you mentioned, you've got, yeah, I mean, if, if Russian athletes are allowed to play, which it seems right now that they will be, You've got Medvedev, Rublev, Kachanov, and also pretty much, yes, yeah, Safiuli and Karatsev battling. However, you can also check it, by the way, there's this great website, Live Tennis EU, I guess, 
uh, where you have the live rankings. Right now, maybe it's not as uh, relevant, as not as required for a tennis fan as it was previously, because the ATP currently has their own live rankings on the ATP website. However, uh, when talking about um, the Olympics race, there's this section there where they, they give you like, you know, the, the, the basically how many points the players have amassed until the cutoff. So basically it gives you like a real clear indication of who needs to do what for the Olympics. And by the way, in that ranking, uh, Roman Safurin is 32nd with almost a thousand points. But in order to find Aslan Karatsev, you're going to have to go down quite a lot. He's 72nd with 600 points. So also given that Karatsev is out injured currently, it seems that Karatsev has very little chance. Karatsev is actually even below Pavel Kotov in that ranking. Let's say 99% with with 99% certainty, Karatsev, uh, sorry, not Karatsev, but Safurin should make the Olympics. There's very little chance for Karatsev or um, Kotov to, to uh, push him away from that. Ghost, he says that Dam with more winners right now. Yeah, but how many of that have been from his serve, right? That's what we, we have to look at in this case, I think. And... Uh, Actually, let me see if they were showing these stats on my screen. I guess it's just the serve stats here on this on court number seven. That's what it seems like. I don't see the stats regarding winners and first errors here, at least not officially produced. But yeah, I mean, Martin has hit six aces so far and Tommy has hit none. So that will explain the differential basically. <laughs> Did they change the ball in table tennis at some point? Uh, hmm. I mean, there, there might be different regulations. There was definitely, like, in terms of what the, uh, what the ball is made out of. Like, I think they just eliminated the uh, non-plastic balls. But, um, yeah, I'm honestly not too, not too sure about that. Because right now, I think there's simply a, a rule that it has to be either plastic or celluloid, right? And I think back in the day, maybe it wasn't as clear. Like, I think that there, there might maybe some other uh, balls were basically usable. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. The only like real rule change that I remember in recent years was the one that now the rockets don't have to be you know, the rubbers on your racket don't have to be black and red. You basically only have to have one black rubber and the other can be any color. Of course, not black because then you, the opponent wouldn't know which one you're using for a certain shot, which only matters if you have different rubbers. But, you know, that happens quite a lot. But basically, yeah, it, it can be like green, blue or whatever right now. <laughs> I hate that change. I, I don't really understand why it's in place. I mean, I understand they just want to sell more rubbers in different colors, I suppose. But yeah, I don't, I don't really get that. Uh, I think it takes away from the sport a little bit to me, but well. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think when it comes to the uh, material that the ball can be made out of, I think there's been some changes. Right now it has to be uh, basically celluloid or some plastics material. And maybe, maybe earlier there was, um, there were some other things um, allowed. Anyway, let's see if Martin Dunn can keep going. Uh, well, Martin Dunn not can keep going, but if he can kick off the second serve with a hold. Dam literally taking the racket out of uh, Paul's hands here. With that serve, Tommy's racket just fell out of it. He also can't block this next return into the court.
Whew. That's another crazy error from them. But thankfully for him, it comes at 40 love. As I said, I mean, he's, he's definitely quite shaky with his base end game. Sometimes it can look pretty good, which is why that, you know, I'm not really ready to call him a serve bot or anything. When people say that he's like Isner's second coming, I don't buy into that. But I mean, yeah, he makes a lot of very simple errors. So, you know, it's, it's kind of lazy commentary, but it is the case. Martin Dam, another ace here to get the first game on the board. This one was very pleasant for him, just that one error that he made, but it came at 40 love. Lawn ping pong, I like that, yeah. Um, most of the time I say table tennis in English, yeah. I mean, just sounds bigger, right? <laughs> just sounds like something more professional than uh, two kids hitting balls in a park or something. But um, actually in Polish, I am very often going to say ping pong rather than tennis of it. <laughs> Although if I if I wanted to say that I you know tell someone that I play the sport, I would probably say I play tennis though of it, because um, I don't know. Again, it just sounds more professional. <laughs> but if I if I tell someone that I'm going to my practice session or whatever, I just say I you know going to ping pong or <laughs> I have ping pong on Thursday or something like that. So. <laughs> I guess it depends, but but in English I very rarely say ping pong. Yeah, actually, in English I almost often, almost always say ping pong. Let's see, Tommy Paul. Whoa, start returning. I think so. It's probably Martin's best of the match. Tommy going for this like pretty arched, if you may, um, first serve out wide. Lots of spin on it, not that much pace, and Dam has to kind of scramble to it, but he manages to get the angle just right on the backhand cross. So 15.30 now, and that's a real opportunity maybe coming up for the youngster. Fires another massive return though. It keeps him in the rally, but you cannot miss a slice like this, and also just throw it into the middle of the net. Yeah, that's rough. I guess he fired that big return down the middle forehand and just kind of didn't think that anything real was going to come back from Tommy. I don't know. Maybe he was just expecting to gain more advantage out of that shot than he actually did eventually. But um, yeah, a bit of a lousy slice. He gets the next point, though. Paul approaching after this back in plus one, but was just like nowhere near good enough. And Dam gets the passing shot just into the corner of the court. While Tommy Paul and Diego Sebovita are still not playing apparently. Well, that's that's wild. Tommy saves the breakpoint again, and he goes for the down the middle serve just at the body, you know, of, of Martin Dam. And this seems to be the play for him so far. He's mostly struggling when Martin takes the return early, and he kind of is unable to just move away in time. It's it's a great play, honestly, from Tommy, and I, I'm pretty sure that he spots it by now because all the key moments he's gone for it in the last few games.
This time the slicing from Dam is better, and he opens up the court with the lefty forehand down the line. Really nice top spin on it as well. Produces a great strike after Paul's slice here. So one more breakpoint coming up. Will it be Paul going at the body again? Uh, kinda. But the serve is out. So this is the cleanest opportunity that Dam has had in a while. Let's see. Uh, he gets the return in play. Didn't hit it too cleanly, but he is in the rally. That's half the success, I suppose. Although maybe not for him, as most of these exchanges where like Paul is just slowing things down and trying not to make an error, mostly it's going to be Martin missing a shot, right? And that's what happens here. He overcooks this forehand cross. <laughs> it's never going to be X. Yeah, this is going to be good enough from Paul now. Didn't even go for anything like on this on this forehand plus one. Doesn't maybe open up the court, but it's going to be enough, especially against someone who's not too fast, not too good on the first two steps as down. It's going to be enough. And I guess that's that's kind of Tommy's one of Tommy's best assets as well, right? The percentage plays and stuff. And it is one more game for Tommy Paul, one more game where he has to face face breakpoints and just comes out of it mostly with good serving again at the body when it matters and that, that's been the winning play for him five out of five five breakpoints so far and he saved them all why did it change to x <laughs> that's a good sort of philosophical question sean because elon musk came in and he um bought Twitter and he changed it to, you know, more to his style, if you may. And, um, well, the, some of the changes have been awful, but, you know, at least the platform is going and at least the platform is seemingly nowhere close to dying. I will never pay money for it, at least in the way it's the, the way it is right now, like how ridiculously expensive the premium thing is, but I guess that's what Elon wants me to do. And also, uh, yeah, hardcore specialists. Someone recently asked me on the on, on the stream, I remember, what's my best surface in table tennis? <laughs> I think it might have been keen. That's a sick serve again from them. Sometimes when the ball just flies away from Tommy right, right after impact, there's nothing he can do. And of course, yeah, the lefty angles do come into this quite a lot. 30-15 right now for them, just basically for serving well. Although that, that previous slice that he had, uh, sorry, slice, the previous smash that he had was pretty tough at 15 all well at low 15 actually so it could have been a more important point than than it eventually was because he landed it during the changeover i might give you a bit of an update on what's happening on the on the other courts as well as martin dam is rushing the net here after the serve and just barely misses this forehand volley Again, there's a lot of room for improvement in the dumb serve in the dumb serve and volley game in the dumb net approach We'll see how it goes over the years. I mean, um, I think at the challenger level, he's sometimes well more than capable of like playing baseline tennis against the top guys as well. I wonder if that's going to be still the case on the main tour. Maybe he's going to have to dig into that seven volleying style a bit more. Who knows? Of course, as I said, he kind of hasn't had any pro tour main. I mean, you know, main tour top players' experiences. This is literally the first top 20 match that he's playing. The round one against Julian Zhang was the first top 90 match that he was even playing. So, um, yeah, this is still, of course, you know, a bit like a learning opportunity and just a chance to check out his level against the top guys. Of course, he's played with, like, practiced with them many, many times. You know, as, a, as a youngster in the IMG Academy, I mean, I'm pretty sure he's gotten a lot of quality playtime with 
these fellows, but it's still different to play them in a match than on the practice courts. One thing that's obviously holding up well, and it's always going to, is the serve, which right now he uses to fend off this break point. Ace out wide. Recently in Koblenz, actually, Dam hit 39 aces in a free set match against Kukushkin. Not quite at the same pace here, obviously, but he still had a hit a fair few that just kind of make you think that it's impossible to catch a serve like this. And one more, actually, I think. Or no, it was out, really. No, it's it's a let, I guess. That's pretty unfortunate because it seemed that the sheer pace and the, the way that it was landing in the corner of the court, you know, not so much about the spin this time, but again, it was kind of ungettable. But he will produce a let again. So serving for the third time already. I think Sabo Wild and, and uh, Fritz will be on court soon, but I don't know how, ga how uh, you guys are going to be with that information. But I think at this stage we might just stick to Paul Dump, though. <laughs> we are basically in the second set anyway. Well, it required some lets. It required some of his serves clipping the tape here, but eventually he gets one in that doesn't. And it's a killer. I mean, it's not an ace, but effectively it works right about the same. Yeah, they kind of have. That's what I read too, that they made Medvedev the villain and Zverev as like the positive character. Which was a bit of a, um, I would say they overstepped because I understand that they didn't want to mention the allegations and stuff. I mean, after all, this is still like PR for tennis. It, it shouldn't work like this. It shouldn't work like this. But uh, sure, I mean, I can understand why it was the case. However, uh, maybe going too much into it and just, yeah, painting that Borg McEnroe picture, if you may, with them. <sighs> Yeah, but second second uh, season, I did not watch a single episode. First, I only watched one. I was not interested in the show to begin with, and that one episode just showed me that, uh, indeed, I should not be watching this because there's nothing in it for me. It was the Madrid, um, Badosa, Jaber, uh, Pegula episode, um, basically the one where the, the 2022 Madrid episode when uh, Ons beat Jessica Pegula in the final. <laughs> Must be frustrating playing that guy 100%. I mean, Tommy is like lining up for, you know, won the previous point, deuce, maybe you can get a shot, but then you just have to watch another ace fly by you. Not much you can do about it either. But of course, so far he's been keeping himself, uh, well, let's say not even afloat, of course, but, you know, in the lead in this match with that with these breakpoint save serves earlier. So I guess there's not that much to be frustrated about for Tommy yet. Will he win this point, though? It's a crazy rally at the net, and eventually Dam gets it done. Some good reflexes here from him, I would say. Uh, most of the balls were, like, on his racket coming at him, but sometimes that could be tricky as well. And, uh, yeah, let me tell you what's happening on the uh, mm -hmm. other arenas. Uh, still not playing Teriago Sabovilt and Taylor Fritz, so we definitely made a good call to start watching this one. Uh, in the meantime, Nicolas Jari and Jack Draper are on serve. Um, Draper, I saw, was like a massive favorite in that match, I think to a, to a much bigger extent than he should be, since, you know, it's still a close affair. I mean, two big servers, right? Doesn't seem like... Oh, and he was actually 5-3 up as well in that set, so that must be a little painful. For No, 5-3 up, and he's 5-4. Wait, maybe my scoring is a little outdated. Can I refresh it? Um, yeah, they are 5 all now. Anyway, um, the, we also have Tris O'Connor and Francis Tiafo heading to a tiebreak. As Ghosty said earlier, Talon Hrikspor and Alex Mikkelsen are in a tiebreak. And Dominique Kepfer seems to be right on, um, sort of on the verge of securing a one-set lead against Sebastian Baez on hard courts. That's not a surprise. Jessica Pagula is uh, winning against Ninju for now somewhat comfortably. 6-4, free love. Uh, there's also Leila Fernandez up a set on Emiliana Arango. 
and Anastasia Potapova is up a break early on against Daniel Collins. Ghosty will not be happy to hear that, but of course still a lot of time for Daniel to get that uh, much, um, you know, to be tighter and to catch Potapova. And as I said earlier, Justin Paulini was the first winner of the day over Katie Volinets. Still plenty of matches that were interrupted yesterday that are yet to start free on the men's, free on the women's. I do not really have a clue what's happening in Save of Wild Fritz anymore, but well, we made the call and it seems that we made the right call. <laughs> Tommy Paul, one two down now, serving. It's a pretty uncomfortable mm -hmm. return from Martin. And oh my goodness, has told his ankle again. Seems like it's the left too. So there was a passing shot from them. That's not looking good. Let's see if he can keep going. They're calling the trainer now, I think. As Tommy just basically sprinted on his, you know, hopped on his right leg to the bench. Yeah, Tommy, Tommy was hopping on his right leg to the bench and basically is sitting there right now. Dam is giving the umpire uh, an umbrella so that the the ball boy can hold it over Tommy's head, I suppose. Yeah, the ball boy didn't know what to do with it, but that was Martin's idea. That was pretty funny because the ball boy just went the other way. Uh, Tommy is asking Greg Allensworth now to help him stand up and he's going to sit on the bench still grabbing his leg. It seems that the uh, trainer is going to be coming onto the court soon. We'll see. Um, it's not looking too good, but uh, who knows? Maybe he's going to be able to continue. Someone says on Twitter that it looks like a knee injury as well, rather than the ankle. I don't know. Let's let's see what they're what he what they're gonna be treating him for. Yeah, he has one leg on the arm of the bench and basically is holding it. I don't know if it's the knee, the, the shin or the ankle yet. But uh, someone is there already with him, just talking to him right now. Chris O'Connell winning the first set against Francis Tiafo. It didn't go to a tiebreak after all, but um, I guess that's not too surprising, right? I mean... Right now, with Francis's form, it's definitely a losable match for him. Not much that I can update you on um, on any other court. So let's see what happens here with Tommy. <laughs> Damn it, yeah. To me, it looks like more of that ankle thing, but let's let's see. For now, he's like trying to walk around the bench, or well, standing up for it on it for 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 now. Let's see. Oh, and it's over. Aye, aye, aye. Yeah, it's it's over right away. It 
So Martin Damas into the third round of Miami in a pretty weird way, uh, for sure. But um, yeah, that is that is that is the case. Ah, Paul isn't that bad on clay. If he catches some good form around the part of the season, I, I don't think he's going to be awful. For Martin Dan, by the way, this means advancing to the... Well, let's say he's going to be 175th in the live rankings for now. We'll see if he can turn it into something even more uh, sometime soon. Definitely has a lot of time when he can just gain points, not much dropping other dumps than some ITF runs. Uh, but yeah, obviously not a comfortable way of advancing to the to the third round here, even though it's his best career match and uh, round uh, result, you know, and quite a happy feeling in that sense for sure. But yeah, all in all, that's I'm going to turn over to the uh, Sable Vid stream now. Ankle or knee? To me, it looked like ankle. But uh, I don't think we got like any real confirmation. But to me, it looked like ankle again. Someone said to, a knee on Twitter, but I uh, to me, it looked a lot more like ankle. All right, let's look for the Saberville Fleet stream there. I have actually just started, so you know we can use that Paul Dam thing as a lead up. Yeah, sure. I mean, why not? We can use that Paul um, Paul Dam thing as lead up. I'm surprised they don't do ankles even more. They must be strong. As in, yeah, I mean, tennis is, is definitely a sport where you can do that, where you can injure his, your ankle easily. And the Mare famously plays in a couple of braces. A lot more players, too, afraid of such an injury. But, uh, yeah, that's kind of unfortunate, obviously, for Tommy. He was up a set. He was probably the stronger player. He was playing smart on all the break points. But um, yeah, for them, a slice of luck. Let's see what he can turn it into, into the in the next round. I actually believe that he is going to play Jario Draper next. I, I have to check if that's correct. But uh, yeah, Jario Draper next in the third round. So, you know, it would be amazing for Martin if he can turn that slice of luck into something even more But. All right, um, so that's it for Paul Dam. Let's talk about uh, Sabofield and Fritz right now. Uh, there was something in the chat that I wanted to reply to. Oh, who is behind the US Tennis Center Twitter? Um, I can't remember now, but um, I, this guy used to text me from his account, and then he started that US Tennis Center account, and now that's from that account. But uh, it's like, a, you know, 
a, a pretty small account that created it uh, um, a year or so ago. No one, you know, um, uber famous on Twitter, no. Paul has been playing more matches than usual. Perhaps his body was just worn down. I mean, he's played a fair few for sure, uh, but also like ankle injuries have this unfortunate uh, thing where if you only like twist it once, it's probably going to be a little bit weaker, you know, for the rest of your life, really. I'm not saying it will crack at every possible moment, uh, but, you know, I've had my fair share of ankle twists and uh, I have to to say that it is true like it, it's very common for me to just stand uh poor like literally just walking you know my my leg my foot my ankle kind of just gets a little twisted and then i'm like oh no is it one of these where i'm gonna be out for 10 days or is it one of these where uh, you know it's just gonna hurt for a while and then i'm gonna be fine usually you can tell by whether it's swollen or not <laughs> like that that's the that's the main thing i think but um yeah, once you injure it a little, once you injure it once, it's likely to be a little weaker. So given that he had an injury on that leg just a few days ago, I think that kind of comes together for sure. Uh, what do you think of Andy Roddick's show? I have not listened to it. I do not consume any tennis podcasts or shows. Tennis is a massive part of my life, and it's massive enough where. If I have free time, I'd rather do something non-tennis oriented. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically that means that I don't consume any uh, tennis shows. I'm not particularly interested in it either. Like, you know, I, I don't think it's gonna be sort of to my, um, what, I, what I wanna hear about. I don't think so, right? And if you have Andy Roddick and John Wertheim talking about like, politics you know and stuff no I, I that, that's not really something that i'm involved in and yeah i've got a knee like that says jane yeah possibly it works with other parts of the body as well <laughs> thankfully my experiences so far has only been uh, the right ankle but um i can definitely confirm that uh, after i twisted it for the first time it's been a lot, a lot more loose since. It's not loose enough to like for me to play every single time in an ankle brace or something like that. But yeah, it's actually pretty common for me to just lightly injure it by walking, <laughs> which isn't great. Um, but most of the time, it's still you know there's still like a lack of caution I need to uh, exhibit in order for it to show up. But of course, when you're playing tennis, especially at this level, like you kind of can't have caution in your steps, right? You you have to go for it. You have to scramble for balls at your highest possible speed and your high pos highest possible flexibility, athleticism. So yeah, it seems like for Tommy, uh, this will be, um, you know, he's out of Miami, obviously. Now he's probably was going to play Phoenix, uh, Phoenix, uh, Houston. Let me see if he was indeed signed up for it. I think last year he did pretty well. So yeah, he's signed up for Houston and Monte Carlo. Maybe one of these will, will need to go. Who knows? Maybe he's going to be ready for Houston. But I think it would be sensible for him to just skip Houston and go to Monte Carlo. Obviously, it's not an easy call for someone like Tommy because I think last year he did pretty well in Houston. So. Uh, and generally... No, actually, no. Last year he lost in the second round. Who, who was I thinking of then? I was thinking of some American player. Anyway, never mind. Oh, Francis Tiafo, of course, won Houston uh, last year. Yeah, never mind then. So yeah, I think it's actually a pretty easy call then for Tommy. I would I would skip uh, I would skip Houston points and uh, Houston uh, entirely if I were him and just go to Monte Carlo. Uh, the ankle should be ready for uh, Monte Carlo probably. I mean, it's like two weeks ahead, two weeks from here, but. Uh, just give yourself some more time in Europe. I think that's the smart thing to do if you're Tommy, this this uh, clay swing. But we'll see. Of course, it depends on the severity of the injury as well. Yeah, Francis is definitely going to fall quite a lot. Leila Much score currently is 6 4 4 1. She is leading. She is leading comfortably. Not too big a surprise either, I suppose, because, well, Emiliana Arango is very high in the rankings compared to her 
90% of her results, let's say, but that's mostly mm -hmm. because of that Guadalajara quarterfinal, right? Otherwise, she hasn't had any standout results. We have also had on the uh, men's side, we have also had, well, pretty much, no, no, sorry, no, no matches have finished yet, but we have had Taylor, Talon Griekspor winning the first set against Alex Mikkelsen. Kepfer is now a set and a breakup on Baez. And that's really kind of it. Uh, all mm -hmm. matches have, have started now. They were the ones that were supposed to. Thiago Sebovild up 2-1 on Taylor Fritz, and that's what we're going to be talking about uh, very soon. Uh, I did turn on the stream already, but I was just sort of busy talking about the other stuff. But yeah, right now I'm going to pay attention. Yeah, 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 Jane. That Houston event last year was a big mess. I think Tommy, in fact, played the round, round of 16 on Saturday as well. So, like, he went out in the second round, but he went out in the... Uh, he went out to um, Huntman in the second round, but on Saturday. And I think he also pulled out of um, Monte Carlo because of it, right? So, probably the smart thing to do right now would be to skip Houston and go to Monte Carlo, I think. And perhaps his expectation... Like, perhaps his experience mm -hmm. from last year also maybe told um well taught that to tommy let's see tiago said both with two one up but it's now fleet serving uh as for this much which i haven't really you know I haven't been able to talk about it too much and like do any lead up to it. But uh, the main thing here is like whether Thiago Sepovit will keep up his level. I think if if so, he can definitely beat Taylor. But uh, it's kind of a new thing for him to qualify for both Indian Wells and Miami to be playing such good tennis on hard courts. Not that it's not really like possible for Sepovit to produce on hard. I actually think there's no. Like virtually no reason for him to be a clay specialist, but the the truth is that he, like his main tour results on hard courts, not really even his main tour, his professional results after winning the U.S. Open Juniors title, his professional results on hard courts have been awful. Like he's never done anything, um, other than pushing Rublev to five, of course, at the Australian Open. But that's also this year, so maybe that was a bit of a sign that something could be happening for him soon and now indian wells in miami he's having a great time of course it all came to a very very early crash when he played fabian marojan at the um well in indian wells round three but he managed to qualify there he beat kachanov so he could be about to post another top top 20 win here he was great in the opening round against nuno borges as well nuno borges the recent phoenix champion generally since the beginning of the sunshine double sabre Vilt is seven and one He's won all his matches in straight sets, other than the 2-6-6 two, six, two, six loss to Marojan, which wasn't great. And uh, even if Fabi might be a bit of a tricky matchup for him, you know, taking time away and stuff, yeah, just wasn't a performance that I think he would have been, he would be proud of, uh, Thiago Sebovit. Here, we're talking about a bit of a different scenario because he's facing Taylor Fritz now, and I think Taylor is actually a bit of a better opponent for Sabovit. Like, as long as he can maybe keep up with the serve return game of Fritz, and especially with, you know, how easily Taylor can rattle off service games somehow, uh, some, somehow, sometimes. Um, I think as long as he can keep up with that, probably there's not going to be that much early pressure in rallies for him. So there is a possibility for him here, I think. And Fritz, of course, we've been talking about this, but like, Despite being such a consistent player, he kind of often gives the lower ranked guys a chance because he's so, I mean, can I say one dimensional? I know Gosti doesn't really like the word in regards to Rublev. Does he like it in regards to Fritz? He kind of just plays the same ball every single time. You know, he plays a very clean ball of both wings, definitely. But there's not much in terms of like variety and throwing your throwing your um, opponent under the pass, taking the rhythm away. Taylor doesn't really do that. So um, when he plays someone like Jean Jean in Madrid, even Wu in Dallas, not to go to Asian about this, 
Diego Schwartzman even in Shanghai last year, Alexander Shevchenko in Basel, right? Uh, and to come back to Asia, I guess there was Shintaro Mochizuki in Tokyo as well. He plays like an inspired opponent and he doesn't really have any way of, uh, yeah, just taking that rhythm away from them, just mixing it up so that they are thrown out of their comfort zone and out of their uh, inspired mode. And uh, it is a problem for him, definitely. It is a problem for him. They kind of get used to his ball after a while, and then it's not as dangerous anymore. So I, I do like Sebovic's chances here, but he has to stay on point. He has to be as good as in the previous rounds, which, as I said, in Indian Wells, when he played Marojan in the third round, boom. And it was just like a crush. You know, the, the first two, three games in Indian Wells, round three against Fabian, and you just know that the match is over. I guess it's part of Sableville and his game, you know, that he's going to throw in this stinker every once in a while. And if he wants to win today, obviously that day cannot happen on this particular occasion. Borges didn't win easy in Phoenix, 7-5, 7-6 over Berrettini. No, I mean, it was a it was a title defense, of course, for Nuno, but he uh, did play very good tennis on the way against Berrettini. He was down early, but after that, it was kind of just like Matteo forcing him to earn it. it he was um, down 5-6, uh, sorry, 5-7, 3-5, saved a match point then already, Matteo. So it, it was a little easier than the scoreline suggests, you know, easier in that, you know, how generally the match was going, but just like the whole week, like Berrettini's fighting spirit, great, they were on, on point. Like he was just making the players earn their wins. And sometimes like against Atmane or against Kazo, making them earn these wins actually resulted in a win for Matteo. <laughs> A lot more players should mix in a loopy ball. Is it harder to do than it looks? Um, I wouldn't say so. I think this is something that mo even on the coaching level, but also on like the mindset level, is kind of not involved in tennis all that much. Like This is a dimension because I guess how you're hitting the ball is, is dimensional and you, know, you have height, you have width, you have depth, basically like these, these three dimensions. And height is the one that never really gets talked about. So you get, you talk about the angles, how you open up the court. Obviously depth is like everyone's main uh, focus during the match. Like depth is the cleanest, the easiest, the most obvious way of um, disrupting your opponent, well, not, not even disrupting, but like to, of making your opponent uncomfortable, of making it tough for your opponent. Not many are talking about the height, and I guess you know players from the past, like I don't know, even Rafael Nadal, right, should should be telling us that this is actually a, a very underused um, topic in the well, not only modern game, but I guess as a whole. And um, more players should be able to have that ability. Yeah, sure. Of course, it's not going to be the main strength of Taylor Fritz, but that would already give him something to at least throw the opponent uh, kind of just, you know, throw him a curveball from time to time. Recover. Um, manage to neutralize the rally somehow. Also, you know, in a way that's not slicing and that's not relying on your athleticism. Because for someone like Taylor, like most of the time, it's not going to be easy for him to recover the rally from a defensive position. He definitely scrambles pretty well for his footwork in general, but um, yeah, I mean, that could be another way of giving you more time. Was the Daniel score? It's 6-2 coins. <laughs> wow. Six games in a row. Nice. And we have it on the screen as well. What can you say? I, I did, I, I think I had, I don't know where I would be doing this, but I seem to recall picking a winner from that match. Maybe it was someone asking me or maybe it was an article somewhere, but I, I seem to remember picking Collins just because, well, 
this year she's been playing inspired stuff, right? I mean, ever since announcing her retirement, it's like she kind of doesn't care anymore and in a positive way, you know? There's no hesitation, there's no doubt, there's just straight up confidence and hitting freely. Of course, it's not going to amount to her winning every single match. There's still uh, There was still that injury in Austin. There was still that uh, Iga Świątek match in Indian Wells where after the first seven games, she's just done. It's not going to suddenly turn her into a Grand Slam winner, if you may. Maybe. <laughs> I'm not saying it, it can't, but you know, it's not going to turn her into like a top three player right now. But it, it does turn her into someone who's going to just keep messing up players over the year. If she maintains that free hitting attitude, Ghosty also says that it's a kind of home event for Danielle. I actually don't know where she's from originally. I know where she played college tennis, but I don't know where she's from. Ah, oh, St. Petersburg. Yeah, okay. Then it is definitely. And she also played college at Florida. I didn't know. I thought it was just Virginia, but apparently she also did a year in the for the Gators. So. Uh, I guess both college and hometown. But yeah, basically it seems like she she trained in, at some St. Petersburg club and then the IMG Academy as well, graduated in St. Petersburg. So yeah, indeed, it's, a, it's basically a home event for her. Hello. So, hello, hello. I will find some earphones. Hopefully there's no echo. Oh yeah, let me know if there is on my end as well. <laughs> No, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> no, no, no. They're giving me some tough tasks already in the chat. and. Uh, oh, yeah. Hmm. I can imagine. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to guess. You can guess, it's fine. Go for it. <laughs> okay, so someone recently, I think it was Nick actually, on the chat, Told me that's like Kira. I don't know if that's true. It is true. Okay. Perfect. Well done. I, I don't know if that's how I would have pronounced it, but Nick, <laughs> oh, you did that. well. You did well. Yeah, Kira. Yeah, well done. Piece of advice. So thank you, Nick Carter. <laughs> you were able to save me from some embarrassment, and thank you, British tennis players on tour, for the great stream, guys. Um, so yeah, save of it, Fritz. Have you been watching that much already? No, I was actually on the Jack Draper match okay. before, but I've switched over. Um, that one wasn't super high quality, to be honest. So hmm. not missing out. <laughs> if you want to stick with that one, you know, we can also, we can also do like, you know, I watch that one, you watch that oh, one. Oh yeah, I'll keep an eye on it, definitely. It's your I'll have a quick look at Fritz for now. How's Fritz getting on? Uh, yeah, I mean, so far it's been pretty close. I've been talking about the fact that, you know, Sabofield has seems to have done some major hardcore progress the past couple of events, basically, in Indian Wells mm -hmm. and Miami, and how, uh, well, there was never really any true reason for him to be like a full-on clay court specialist, but, well, he wasn't really showing us anything on the hard courts in professional tennis ever since winning the US Open Juniors. So mm -hmm. I'm glad to see it now. And uh, yeah, to me, it's, it's, a, it's a proper upset alert. I mean, so far after 23 minutes, we've had, we have seven games completed already, which kind of tells you a lot about how this yeah. match has been going. Too. Yes, it does. Yeah, I was thinking that has gone very, very quickly. Yeah, we also had that Paul Dam um, retirement earlier. We basically wanted to cover Save of Retreats, but then it turned out that they couldn't start for like an hour or something. <laughs> it took ages. Yeah, I have no clue what they were doing there <laughs> because no. I, I, I just decided to stop watching the, the vacuum cleaner guy and actually <laughs> talk to Paul and Dam, which Very uh, good yeah. idea. it yeah, was I a good idea, but it resulted in an injury, of course. Yeah, no, I feel really sorry for Tommy Paul. I think that it's really strange that the stadium would be the only one that, that couldn't be played on, but I suppose it is because of that strange roof and not having the sun on the court in the same way as the other places. But it's still a bit strange that that one would take longer to dry when it's their sort of big feature court. But there you are. Yeah, precisely. I, 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 I read something like that on Twitter and it, it makes sense. John, John has got to stop bringing football into these tennis streams. My goodness, every time, every time recently. Oh, it's it's ages ago. I've moved on. I've moved on, John. 
Yeah, we, we've memed about that before, that like he um, basically anytime there's a stream, anytime he's on the stream, but apparently even when he's just in the chat, you know, 15 okay. minutes and you're going to have a Manchester United reference. Yeah. And right now after they have that 4-3 over, over Liverpool and um, FA Cup, was it? Yeah, yeah. Like the, he just keeps mentioning that. Absolutely. I should never have mentioned that I was a Liverpool fan. It was clearly the biggest mistake. Oh. Yeah. So that's yeah. why he mentioned That's why. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, thankfully I have no associations with any club. Although I, I'm wearing a Germany uh, shirt. I was going right to say, now. yeah. <laughs> that's that's absolutely random. Uh, <laughs> it's I think like 2006 or something. It, it is an old shirt. Vintage. Uh, does that count as vintage now? Probably not. Quite yet. Uh, it could. It could. Like you know. 2006 football for me is kind of vintage. Like that's the first yeah. big event that I remember the, the World yeah. Cup. So, so for me it, it does feel vintage. There's definitely a lot of nostalgia there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, just the Draper match that I was watching. He did have a chance to serve out the set at five four, broke mm -hmm. for five four. No, broke for five three actually, and was serving for the set. But he just he looked like he really froze up. Uh, and Jerry took advantage, um, and now he's won. Jerry's won the tie break, so a good recovery from Jerry. But it did feel like Draper sort of froze there. Yeah, the Miami conditions hot, humid as well, but maybe not as hot today after all the rain. Maybe that's good yeah. for Jack. Because, You'd yeah, hope. Obviously, he's but it seems physically. Humidity like really everyone. bothers him. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Or not even humidity, you know, last week in, uh, two, well, two weeks ago already in Indian Wells, he was out against Chris O'Connell and there you're not going to have any humidity. I mean, it's the desert. <laughs> A little bit. But, yeah. but yeah, any tougher physical, like uh, any tougher weather conditions, basically, which is a, a big shame, of course. Uh, they, he clearly gets a lot of respect right now. Like I, I checked the odds earlier for Sabo, uh, for, Sabo, for Draper and um, Jari and Jack was like a massive favorite there, which was a little weird really? to me. Yeah. I mean, two big servers, you me. know. Yeah, they're, they're kind of like pricing him like a top 20 player already, which he could be, you know. We still haven't seen him play a full year healthy. He could be <laughs> a top 20 player if he does that. But um, they're kind of like banking on it already, at least for yeah. now. Yeah, that feels a little bit disrespectful to Jarry and his position in the rankings to me, but oh well. Probably a little disrespectful is also how Seibovild was uh, treated, but well, we'll see if it's if it's right for now. He has a low 30, well, 15, 30 now. Maybe uh, this will be the first opportunity he gets in this match, but you know, for now he's definitely holding up okay. Earlier I was just talking about like Fritz and overall how maybe he's not the most imposing player against all of these guys. Like he just kind of hits the same ball every time. They get used to it and. He's he's a good candidate to play. Like when you're when you want to score a breakthrough win, Taylor Fitz is probably a decent player you can do it against. Like last year it yeah. was all of these guys, you know, Ibing Wu, Zhizhen Zhang, Shevchenko, um, there's some Omochizuki, they all beat Fritz, and they probably wouldn't most other top twenty players. And it's gonna be two breakpoints for Sabo Build now too. Just a good return that Taylor with his beautiful footwork can't mm. get back. Yeah, definitely. The the people who are looking, like you say, for that breakthrough win, it does seem like uh, Taylor Fritz is got quite the candidate for it. Um, but like you say, maybe that is just because of his predictability. More than anything else, you can sort of learn to play him more than the others, perhaps. Yeah, and it's pretty funny when you think about it because, like, you know, he's one of the most consistent players as well. But um, on England, it's like that top 20. He has spells of like reaching the semi finals in every event. But yeah, um, it's actually the case. And Thiago Sebofi breaks another good like return one to punch. He got that opportunity on the forehand, cracked it, and got the, uh, got the error. So 5 3 up now. And this would be huge. I mean, I think he's only had one top 20 win on hard courts so far. This was, of course, Indian Wells against Karen Hachanov. So to do it in like this short amount of time. Also before Indian Wells, he never even had an ATP 1000 win um, mm -hmm. in the main draw. I, I don't think he's even played it, played that um, level many times. It's kind of funny as well that some players like appear at the Grand Slam stages mm -hmm. somewhat regularly, but they don't actually play the ATP 1000s because especially yeah. with 
96 players, draw, 96 player draws. Uh, well, sorry, like with these events that aren't 96 player draws, it's very hard to get into, tougher than into a slam. But yeah, yeah before Indian Wells, Sablefield had no wins. Now he already has three and looking for his fourth potentially. Yeah, definitely. He's got set points on my screen. Oh, so you have a very quick uh, stream then. I have like a couple. One is very fast, one is pretty slow. Uh, I actually changed the slower one because I was assuming that yours would be more or less in line with that. But No, I always seem to be ahead of That's most good. people. I, I will change to the faster one there. Yeah, go for it, go for it. I already have a set there. Yeah. 30 minutes, uh, just 30 minutes for nine games. And I, I had an interesting stat earlier as well about the returns made, I think. Where was that? After the first point of the ninth game, I think. I'm trying to find it now. But yeah, basically 62% of Sablefield serves have been unreturned so far, and just 29 for Taylor. Th these numbers are probably slightly different now because that was before the next three points. But yeah, 15 out of 23 serves so far have been unreturned on the um, Brazilians delivery so yeah uh, yeah that's that's pretty, pretty wild and and that's something also that he can't always rely on right because uh well he's not the greatest of servers he doesn't get the sharpest placement he's also yeah. won every point behind his first serve so far granted he hasn't made that many first serves because he only <laughs> has 42 percent but yeah but when he sure. does <laughs> yeah and, that, and, that, and that's something that i was actually talking about earlier um as well that um this might be like the main issue for him if he cannot match Taylor on serve. But so far, he's not only matching him. So far, he's also just beating him in that regard. Yeah, I'm passing him. Um, baseline points won 11 to 10 for save of build. So it's, it, yeah, it's just kind of that serve return game that was supposed to be his um, disadvantage in this match that's keeping yeah. him in the lead. It does feel to me like he's a, he's a player for the big occasion. He loves oh, yeah. when he gets on the, the, you know, like he'll love being on stadium today when he gets the chance to be in front of a crowd or he knows that he's got somebody who should be too tough for him. I think he really thrives on that. And that's where he plays some of his best tennis. No, well, makes total sense. Yeah, definitely a guy who's struggled with motivation over the years. And yeah. uh, when you get him into that match, like Medvedev or John Garros, yeah, that's when he's going to bring out his best stuff which is a uh, great quality to have. But at the same time, of course, you want uh, you want to be good in every event. Um, Ghosty, how come I don't give Rublev credit for being one of the most consistent? I was just not treating him at the same level as Fritz. You know, I was just treating Rublev as someone way above. So that's why I didn't really mention him. But yeah, of course. Although he now lost an opening round, actually, here in this event. And he seems to have a problem with Czech players. <laughs> <laughs> Three out of the last four losses. Jakub Menšík, Izzy Lehečka, and uh, Tomas Mahač, of course, right now, the, the great Czech treble. <laughs> the big three of the Czech community. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> the only top 100 guys they have right now, and very soon maybe three top 50 players. It's, it's yeah. possible. The yeah, chances I think are probably. there. Probable. Yeah, Menchik right now is at 69 in the live rankings, but of course he's going to be like, yeah, he's, he has a lot of time to earn the points, uh, doesn't have any massive results from last year, maybe other than US Open, one challenger title in Prague, Mahat already almost in the top 50, and Lehechka doesn't seem like he'll be leaving it anytime soon. No. Um, Ghosty was also asking about us being surprised about the Kep Ferbaez score. Hmm. It's six three six to cap fair, by the way. Yeah. Ah, thank you for that. Are you surprised? I'm gonna say no. I'm not particularly surprised by that uh, myself, just because I I quite rate Kupfer. I think in recent times the tennis I've seen from him has been quite impressive. Buyers on a hard court obviously can get results, but I'm not super surprised by that. What about you? Yeah, um, I was actually uh, reading some discussion in a group chat I'm on earlier about like Baez, uh, what was that? That if Baez wants to be taken seriously as an actual threat, he's got to start winning more away from the golden swing and that theoretically Kepfer shouldn't be that tough of a task. But I don't really agree with that. Like to me, yeah, Kepfer is just a better player in hardcourts than, than Baez, yeah. which um, 
well, I'm not saying that Baez is awful. Obviously, he's won Winston Salem last year, so he can, he can produce something from time to time. But I think he's kind of got what he could out of that in that Sunshine Double, really, as a whole. Of course, maybe it's a little um, disappointing for him, given how good he was in February, by far the best player in South America. But I mean, he, he won the match that he could in Indian Wells over Fonini, got demolished by Fritz. And here, uh, yeah, I thought Kepfer was the favorite. Also, uh, according to like the bookies as well, Kepfer was the favorite, apparently, you know, that I check it. So I guess that only tells you that we should not be surprised. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think it's just a, a court thing. Obviously, buyers can, can do it, but I, I wouldn't necessarily back him to do it all the time on a hard court. Yeah. It's not amazing for him to lose this much, obviously. It's nothing, yeah. but it's nothing like we haven't seen before from him. And yeah, um, he is probably one of the, the weaker top 20 players right now, especially on hard. Oh, that's a rough one for Fritz. He was already 40 15 in this game and now misses like a total put away at, at Deuce. I, I'm arguing with Fergus Murphy about something as well. I have no idea about what. No, he looks very unhappy with that, but I don't know what. He complaint he'd have it was a poor shot from him yeah <laughs> maybe it's maybe that's just it really yeah yeah no i can't work it out yeah he will need to recover very quickly for that break point now mm. i don't think he's found the first serve either so I've just seen your comment on Salah, Ghosty. Very good choice. Mo Salah is also one of my favourites. Very good footballer. Not a tennis player, but very good footballer. The first football match that I actually like actively remember is the Liverpool match. It's the Champions League final. Um, Liverpool-Milan, the penalties, the love free to at oh, halftime. Yeah. That was quite something. Yeah. Uh, oh, really. yeah. It was like Terrible. pretty late at night for me. I remember my mom waking me up. Of course, in the <laughs> Liverpool uh, goal, there was uh, uh, the Polish goalie, and he did some incredible things in that match. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, it was quite a quite a big one in Poland for sure. And uh, oh gosh, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it was huge. The, the dancing before the penalties was was definitely something that sort of stayed around in in popular culture. Even if yeah. maybe that was like his his last great match, really, because after that he was just succeeded by Reina and then just went to Real to be a substitute. And by the way, someone who is not a substitute so far in this match, Diago Sebovil breaks after all, um, gets into a rally with Fritz and eventually outplays and finds that forehand inside out. Taylor again, oh. kind of scrambling for the shot, but there's, there's not there's no real chance for him to catch it. So he will have to figure things out on return very quickly here. 6 3 yeah. 1 move down. I think Taylor was in the quarterfinals last year, maybe, was it? I, I think it was the quarters because he beat Runa in round four. Yes, yeah, I remember that match, but yeah. Hmm? I remember that match, but I couldn't remember where it was. Yeah, in, yeah. Um, um, quarters he lost to Alcaraz 6 4, 6 right. 2. So, um, generally, the last three editions, he's always been at least in the fourth round. So, it would be a bit of a uh, change, you know, neg in a negative way for him to lose so early here. Yeah. But would it mean much in his ranking situation? Well, doesn't seem like it because there's quite a big gap right now between the top 13 and the rest uh, between him and Ugo Umber currently. Of course, Umber is still in the event, so he could, uh, you know, he could still do something to like uh, make that gap. Um, basically, even if he like maybe makes the final, maybe he could still go ahead of Fritz. But um, yeah, right now it's, there's like a 400 points difference between Fritz at 13 and Uber at 14. So it doesn't seem like it would be a big hit to Taylor's ranking, but no. still probably a big hit for him, like just confidence-wise and stuff. I was going to say, yeah, I think confidence-wise far more it's going to be a problem for him because I think he probably himself would would back himself far more on American courts especially and to not do so well on them could be a bit of a hit going into the, the next few months, I would have thought. And also because of how he lost last week, right? The, the exactly. match he had against Hungary. 
Uh, it, it makes me like laugh a bit how we talk about this match just you know just a week later because we always mention this like this great Rune win, you know, return to form and stuff. But if Fritz wins this match six two, six four, the narrative would be so different. <laughs> yeah. It's just one That's point. True. Yeah. I think it was like a second serve as well from Rune that he hit pretty deep. Uh really the margins were very very slim, but yeah, it well could be why Taylor is like looking so I don't know, just lethargic here so far. Yeah. You know, part of that at least. Obviously, Sabofield is also serving great and yeah, just hitting He's his shots. I mean, the, this winner right now for for to love was amazing too. And so far, no issues on on re, on um, serve for him whatsoever. So that's a clear area of improvement for Taylor if he is to have a chance. That was a great backhand from Sabo Sabox. That was amazing. Matthew says that he's never he's never really gone on board the Draper hype train, not seeing the weapons that will take him to the top 10, looking like more of a grinder. It, it's not wrong. Like, Jack yeah. definitely, after breaking through to the main tour, he did start playing a lot more control-oriented or whatever, however you want to call it. Yeah, in a way, maybe a grinder too. And, of course, to be a grinder, you need to be very good physically. He's not. Um, I would say maybe that that kind of took his game to a new level as well to, to have that ability. But it's possible that he will have to look for what made him great when he was like 18, 19 to, to really break through to the next stage. But yeah, for now, it's always very hard to talk about Draper because like we just want to have him like playing a healthy season. And then we actually can yeah. say when he, you know, what sort of ranking range he could reach. I think he's shown enough to say to, for us to say that top 20 is very achievable. Top 10 mm. at this point in time, that's probably a bit too much. Yeah, I can't. It's really hard to see him making that breakthrough, especially just because he's constantly sort of not healthy and then healthy again. So the top 10 thing doesn't really resonate with me. But yeah, I think top 20 feels achievable, particularly if he can have a real sort of healthy year this year or healthier even, <laughs> just better, really. Yeah, I mean, top top 10 this year, not really, but top 20, I wouldn't be surprised, sure. Uh, I think yeah. I said once that like Jack will probably be a top 10 player at some point in the future. I'm not backing out of this yet, uh, because you know, <laughs> in the future is like 10 years or so. So Yeah, uh, exactly. He's got, of, <laughs> he's got a lot of time. I don't think that prediction yeah. is something I have to regret already. Maybe at some point he will make me regret it. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, no, wait until he's at least 30 before you take that one back. Name a breed tennis player that has big weapons. Interesting comment from Ghosty on the state of British tennis. <laughs> well, I guess not many big hitters, but um... no, not particularly. Well, Jack Draper still is probably the biggest hitter. From... It's prob I was just thinking he's probably the biggest, yeah. and he. And I think again, like he has the capability for it, even if he doesn't show it all the time. So. I guess Kyle Edmund, if we still count him, is well at least on one shot. He's he's a bigger hitter. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, Jack Jack is in the in the top. Let's say of yes. the of the guys around top one hundred, top two hundred. You know, lower yeah. down you could find like Anton Matusevich or whoever. But um, yeah, I would say that's that's kind of it. Alastair Gray for sure. Oh, that's not mm -hmm. that guy's hitter. Um, I guess that's it for the chat for now. So. <laughs> Now that I spent um, an hour looking at the chat, now actually there's a changeover in Save One Beat Beats. So <laughs> it's perfect. Great timing. Do volleys count as a weapon? Again, a philosophical question. But I guess, yeah, I guess they do. They are in a certain way. And they're not what springs to mind when somebody asks the question, but I suppose. Yeah, mostly because if someone is a good volleyer, they're probably a good server too. Like, yeah, it's so it's you, pretty rare. It's pretty rare that you're gonna be a good volleyer, but you don't have any other weapons. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it happens to have players who have good feel, but then they can't use that net skill. You know, these net skills and, yeah. and the touch. So um, at least not that consistently. There was something. Um, 
what did I think of just a second ago? Oh, um, do you think that a part of this Sabre Beast run in Miami is also the crowd support? Because he's like kind of getting more than Taylor Fritz in a way, even. Uh, like <laughs> th there's a lot of resilience. Really <laughs> there's a lot of resilience in Miami. Yeah, I definitely think that would fuel him because like I say, I think that's the sort of thing that he really, really builds on when he's playing. I've 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 never seen him play that well in a match where he doesn't have something like some reason to play well, if that makes sense. Like you said, with the motivation, mm -hmm. I think he really needs some external motivation, whether that's crowd support or like the crowds against him and he gets to sort of fight that. I think he, he can do that too. But um, yeah, I think the crowd support would definitely spur him on, especially playing an American in America. <laughs> but, yeah, that makes some that. sense. Of course. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that he's like a big stage player. So, for him, it's probably even more important. And we have some stats on the screen right now on the serve placement of Save of Wind. I don't really, I'm not really taking much out of it, uh, other than the fact that, well, that was in step one, and like most of these were just unreturned. <laughs> Seems like, especially at the Taylor forehand, um, mm. yeah, pretty much, as, let's say 90% of the serves at Taylor's forehand were unreturned. Yeah. A little, a little better for the American on the backhand side. Not much though, is it? It's it's <laughs> yeah. quite stark. But yeah, and especially if that was supposed to be your one big asset, that's gonna be rough. But let's see, maybe he can still find something. Of course, we are still quite far away. Cyberfield yeah. is definitely that kind of hot and cold player who can just turn it off for a game, like yeah, just switch off, and uh, then he might be in trouble himself. Hmm. I mean, it was thirty minutes for the full first set, so nine games, and it's already been 16 minutes for the first three games of this set, so that might suggest there's a slightly different set to be played, I don't know. Yeah, and just sort of right on cue, uh, he serves at the Taylor Fritz forehand and the return isn't coming back. I think it's now 15 out of 15 on the first serve for Sabre Field, so, so it's a very clear yeah. uh, edge and a very clear reason why this match is, is going as it is yeah right i'm gonna briefly switch over to have a look at the match between sitsa pass and shapovalov just because i can see it's sort of interesting me right now on my score yeah list. yeah that's quite a score line i was not expecting that it's doing, yeah i think dennis leads the head to head like three two but wasn't yeah. it like only grass and clay that he was no no grass and uh so, so clay was actually Tsitsipas he was winning on that i don't remember now but anyway of course it was just like a long time ago so yeah so i think he's got two so dennis has got two yeah all of dennis's wins against Tsitsipas have come on hard courts but they're all like a good few years ago yeah but but Tsitsipas, i guess never beat him on hard then right no. i mean he won in barcelona and somewhere um 3-1 save of it, by the way, another ace than the T. So, yeah, the serving so far has definitely been quite spectacular. I think there was a United Cup match that I was doing a watch along for, um, was it against Hurkacz, maybe? When mm. I was just talking about the serve of the save of it quite a lot and, like, how he actually gets good speed on it, but, like, he just wasn't placing it, you know? He wasn't was, spot, yeah. serving it, spot serving well. But um, maybe that's not a thing, at least in this match so far. And um, that's probably also something that was stopping him from achieving a lot on, on hard courts and yeah off clay in general since um yeah there's just a lot more importance of course on on the serve and now we have a backhand returns made stat as well on the screen and it's 64 percent for fritz so yeah it, it does seem like there's a great disparity between how many returns he makes on the forehand or the backhand yeah definitely not that he's winning the points for the most part, when he's returning off the back, but at least he's making <laughs> he's it. returning them. We'll give him that for now. Yeah. There's a lot of Taylor Fritz shade right now, but, you know, he, he is getting outplayed. I mean, yes, yeah. Wh he whoever is. it would be, we would be talking about that in, in that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, Denis Shafovalov is now two breaks up against its first 5 2, serving for the set. Speaking of players who won't be like too confident about them, their game after a loss, since mm. he was the shuffle here, uh, yeah, that, 
that'd be pretty big, I think. Got a lot of calls for me to talk about Danielle Collins in the chat. <laughs> yeah, Ghosty loves her and he <laughs> constantly tells me to update the score because I did early on and it was two games to love for Tapova. <laughs> ah, since not then, anymore. They, just, yeah, went on an absolute tear. So 6-6-2 six <laughs> six for your girl, uh, Ghosty. Yeah, uh, she's done it. Almost her home event, as you said, fantastic. Yeah. No, no, I mean, um, I'm not even joking, of course. Uh, since announcing her retirement, since saying that she might be giving up after this year, she's been playing a lot more freely and getting a lot more wins. And it makes That's sense. She's going down swinging, if you may. I wonder how, how, what sort of results she would have to start getting, you know, for her to stick around and for her to keep playing. But I know exactly, because there must be part of her when she's suddenly had such an upturn in form. There must be part of her like maybe I could keep doing this, but I wonder whether if that pressure came back and she decided to stay, whether she could even play as well as she has been, or whether it's that freedom that's allowing her to get these wins and just hit freely and not be too fussed about how she's getting on. Yeah, that's one thing. And then also the, the, the physicality and, you know, of course, the, the main reason for her retiring is like all the injuries. So, yeah, yeah we don't know what her body is really would, would allow her for. I mean, this year she's only had that one event, I guess, in Austin when she was really uh, well. First, she like barely got through a match and then she retired in the next one. But yeah, maybe if it was like a more extended patch, like six mm -hmm. months or something, maybe she would struggle again. Who knows? And I see that Dennis has taken the first set as well. That's... Yeah, it hasn't happened on my screen yet, but <laughs> he's got the set point on mine. It's uh, quite simple by the looks of it. This has been a quick service game for him. No, sorry, I was just spoiling because I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. This is all good. All good. The stream. Andy Murray on court as well. Are you an Andy Murray fan? <sighs> it's sort of like I have no choice. You've got no yeah. choice. You're a Brit. It's like. Andy Murray. That's why I asked. That's why I asked. Yeah, yeah <laughs> definitely. No, I am. He was sort of one of my first sort of introductions to tennis when I was younger. So, gotta love him. I think we have Nick here, who's like kind of you know lukewarm on Andy Murray. Like he's he, he's not as big on Andy Murray as some yeah. other uh, Brits that we have on talking tennis. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the most part, it's going to be hard to find a Brit who's uh, not invested in Andy right now. Yeah. Especially as, you know, it's kind of like some of the last opportunities to watch him, really. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm really hoping to see him at Queen's this year. I think it will probably be my last opportunity. I've never seen him play. So fingers crossed. I think I haven't either, but you know, I'm not going to cry about it if I don't. Actually, I might see him, and uh, if he's playing the Grass Challengers again, I might see him in Surbiton. I think I'm going to be heading there. So. Oh, so so I might see him, but again, that kind of depends on his scheduling. The last few years, he's been playing that event, but if he's really willing to try Ron Garros this time, then he might maybe switch up his schedule a little bit. That's if true. he loses round one at Ron Garros, then I think he's probably going to be. <laughs> You'll probably see it. The, but yeah. yeah, if he goes like a round or two into the event, then um, yeah, then it might get a bit tricky. But yeah, I'm, I'm not really going to cry about it. Like, yeah. of course, he's a tennis legend and, you know, part of tennis history. But is he like the most exciting player to watch for me as, uh, you know, as a neutral observer? No, nah, not really. I, it's I can little... understand that. <laughs> I can understand that completely. Yeah, no, it's more of his his fight and his attitude, I think, more than yeah. more of his tennis at this point. Yeah, if, if that's if that's sort of what someone is looking for, I absolutely get that. Yeah, yeah. I'm more about the the big weapons and the the flashy shots. Sometimes I say <laughs> that I just hate tennis, maybe you know, because I like <laughs> all the points ended in three five yeah. shots. But yeah. well, that's that's the good thing about this sport that we have so many surfaces, so many continents, conditions, and basically something for everyone. Absolutely, yeah, totally agree. Also, I know Andy. So. Sorry, Ghosty said Andy Scottish. I know I'm not claiming him. I know he's Scottish. He's very Scottish. Totally fine. I'm not one of those who's like, well, he's British too. No, I know he's Scottish. That's fine. <laughs> totally understand. <laughs> and we were chatting about one hander some sometime earlier. I think even before we turned on the stream, maybe there was a discussion about it in the chat. And Sean is now saying that the one hander isn't dead if they play another one hander, which I would assume is there is a reference to the Shapovalov Sitsibas scoreline. Of course. 
very true. Works quite well against another one-hander, but how many are we going to have left? Don't know. What makes me cry? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, movies sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> That's a strong question. Wow. In tennis, I don't know if anything has ever made me cry. Um, I was really hurt after the, the 2019 Wimbledon final. I was mm -hmm. like struggling to sleep at night, but I don't think I cried. <laughs> I, I, I think might have cried when. <laughs> I think that's worse. I think struggling to sleep is probably worse. I agree. Right? Yeah, like if, if you were just able to get it out of your system and just cry for a while and, and that's mm -hmm. it, that would be better. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think I might have cried after the 2017 Australian Open final, though. Really? Uh, I think that might have been the case, yeah. And that was out of joy, not out of uh, sadness or grief. No, no. But, I, I, you know, it's, it's a bit fuzzy after all these years, but yeah. No, in tennis, I usually do. I usually don't cry watching tennis. No. <laughs> I try not to, but I definitely have. <laughs> I'm trying to think of an example. This one. What happened to the new manager bounce for Big Four? I don't even know what that is. Is it like a management change that he went through? I don't know. And did he get a new coach? No clue. He he probably should. <laughs> <laughs> if he hasn't, he should think about it, perhaps. Things aren't going too great for him right now. So. No, I really miss what I consider to be peak TFO so far. I hope I hope there's more to see from him than what we're seeing at the moment. But oh, yes, Warner has says that he got a new coach. Okay. Mm. I didn't even know that. He was working with Wayne Ferreira, I think, earlier, so I guess that must be it for him. But who's the new coach then? I think uh, it says Diego Moyano. Diego Moyano, okay. I think he was a player, like, years ago, but I don't remember yeah. him too well. Yeah, I didn't even know that. I was still thinking that he was playing of, uh, with, was with Ferreira. In fact, I don't know if I watched Francis Tiafo this year. I mean, he's just become kind of irrelevant. and. <laughs> There was no reason to watch. <laughs> I watched him against Mikkelsen in Dallas, I think. But oh, and mm. when Mahat beat him at at the Australian Open, of course. But I was like, I was gonna say, I watched that one. Yeah. Mahat. yeah, not not the father, but yeah, sure. So I probably should have known that he had a new coach. Is Fritz winning? No, Grupo Four, uh, or however you want to read it. It's uh, he's not. He's uh, three six, three four down. Thiago Saibovic just two holds away from claiming the match. So far, hasn't had any issues on serve as well. So Taylor, if he wants to stay in it, he needs to really fire back almost right away. And just as we talk about him, TFO's just lost to O'Connell. Yeah, he was much point down a second ago. But yeah, no, mm. no, no, he lost much point down as well as Alex Mikkelsen. So it could be a pretty rough situation for the Americans here, in fact, because they were playing, like five of them were playing in the first slot. So you had... Um, well, Paul Dam, of course, one American had to get through there, but Mikkelsen yeah. is much point down. Tiafo just lost, and Taylor Fritz, of course, in a bit of a rut as well. And I guess that's it for now. Later on, there's also they're also going to have Eubanks score that. So more to yeah. come, but at least in that early slot, um, they are really struggling. And Ben Shelton as well. That's very, you know, late at night, late evening, I yeah. guess. But against Martin Landalusa. No, the American women are really having to pick up some of the slack at the moment. Double fault from Save of Field at 15 all. So maybe this is the opportunity that Taylor was waiting for. Yeah, yeah and I guess the American women are doing okay so far. Of course, Daniel Collins. <laughs> of course. Who else would it be? Um, Swarna says, who will be the top US player at the end of this year? I'm assuming you're asking about the males, because I think on the women's it's kind of clear. Yeah, it must be men. So, hmm. Mm -hmm. Hope you look at the race and how they're, um, where they're sitting there right now. Tommy Paul at number nine. Uh, we've got Fritz at 15. And Shelton is at 24. That's already almost 500 points that Shelton has behind Paul. 
But mm. Shelton could also be like that kind of guy who just yeah has a wonderful event somewhere and yeah only just to get it done. So well, it's between these three. Like it's it's pretty clear that it's between these three: Fritz, yeah. Paul, and Tiof and Shelton. If he can keep know. up his recent form, I'd put in a a vote for for Tommy Paul. I mm -hmm. see him as as maybe he could be more consistent than the other two. I don't really see Shelton at the moment coming into a consistent run of form, but that could change obviously as the as the season goes on. No, I, I get that. He's like the sensible pick, I would say, Tommy Paul. <laughs> maybe yeah. Shelton, however, has kind of come into a consistent form, like. After losing the, the first match of the season, he's been winning two matches every single event since. Of course, it's only been two matches every single But only match. two matches, yes. So yeah, I suppose. But, but, you know, it, it is something new for him. I yes. think that was kind of also like my prediction for him at the beginning of the year, that he's not probably going to like, not going to reach the same heights as last year, but he might just, yeah, just start picking up wins more consistently. Because I think last year after the Australian Open, it took, I'm sorry, it took him basically until the US Open to win consecutive matches again on the main tour. He won them in um, Cagliari at the Challenger, but like, yeah, basically un until like Shanghai, it was like four times in a year. Right now, he's already done it five times in a row. But yeah, as you said, I mean, he actually hasn't had a big highlight. He's always winning two matches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I suppose when I think of a consistent run of form, I probably mean like a consistent run of like a, a good amount of going through yeah. tournaments. But I suppose in a way, it might even be more helpful to him to actually be consistent t some points every tournament building that up maybe that's that's a better way for him to improve i don't know there was a break point for Taylor Fritz uh, after Sabovic missed a smash at third all so that could have been a bit of a meltdown uh, Fritz actually got a great return in as well um, i was kind of impressed that Sabovic even picked it up and then <laughs> Taylor missed the forehand that you know wasn't a put away but Still, like, you know, he had the ball. He had a lot of time to do with it, yeah. Uh, but to do something with it. But, yeah, he just he just misses it by a little bit long. So now it's save of up, up uh, game point, which could bring him to a 6-3-5-3 lead. But that smash was like a real moment when he kind of gave something mm -hmm. to Taylor here and um, Fritz wasn't able to uh, take advantage. Also, there was that, you know, finger to the head emotion from uh, save of Butte. <laughs> uh, he is definitely like reacting to the crowd quite a yeah. lot. I can here. imagine. <laughs> yeah, Sitsapas is struggling to hold again here. We're on Juice on his second service game of the second set. Just looks uncomfortable against Shapovalov at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Not Daniel Collins. Six two six two six two six two for Anastasia Potapova, and you know, Gosti, who was the seeded player there? It was not Daniel Collins. So, you know, it's a it's, no a, it's a big upset. It's a it's a big win. Of course, it's not such a big win because you know it's Daniel Collins. We know she has the potential to beat these mm -hmm. players easily, but yeah, it was a win over the third Eve seed. I have to sort of just give him some, you know, appreciation <laughs> because um, he is also a fan of Tommy Paul, I think. So after oh. what happened today, you know. So it's, a, it's yeah, both sides of the coin there. I will say, though, that Avanesia or Jaber, that looks like a very winnable third round match as well for mm. um, for Daniel. And also a Greek sport, Mikkelsen, someone's asking about that in the second set. Alex saved how many match points? Two match points consecutive. So one was on the Greek sport serve in the tiebreak. And he's now taken it to a decider. Fair play. He's obviously heard how the other Americans are doing. And he's like, OK, I'll sort this out. <laughs> Shapovalov did have a break point there, I believe, but Sitspass saved it with a pretty decent serve. So he's serving for the game now. Not a set point, a break point. Sorry. Yeah, again, 15.30 on the free serve, so maybe Sitspass will be out to finish it off even now. It was kind of obvious in Indian Wells because of the higher bounce and stuff that like 
all the balls are going to be exactly in his comfort zone. But like here as well against Fritz, uh, there's like a down the middle, nothing on it shot from Fritz. And right away, he is in trouble. Uh, gets the point here, the big serve and plus one forehand, but still two points away from losing right away. Yeah. And what a return as well from Save of Vita. I mean, Taylor really should have attempted to take it. He let it go, but still on the stretch, he finds the line. So he has a the first match point. Has his serving stayed as good as it was when I was watching it? Pretty much. I mean, the, the previous game was tough. Yeah, he had to save a break point, but I don't know if that was due to the quality of his serve dropping. As I mm. said earlier, he missed that smash at 30 all, which was yeah. pretty brutal. But otherwise, yeah. And he's putting Fritz into trouble, but it seems that Taylor will now get a game point of his of his on his of his own and just try to force Thiago to serve it out. So yeah, no wins into no wins on the at the ATP thousand level coming into the Sunshine Double. No top twenty wins on hard courts, but now he might be about to get one more mm. after beating Kachanov in Indian Wells already. Of course, that kind of came to a crush very early there um, when yeah. he played the, 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 the Fabian Marojan and was just kind of blown off the court. But who you knows? This time he would be playing Stari or Draper. Sape of Victor Fritz. And who is Dan playing? Because I think I earlier said uh, by mistake that he was going to play Jari or Draper. Uh, <laughs> no, but Dan is playing O'Connell. Oh, all right. I mean, that's such an opportunity for him. Yeah, and definitely. For Chris, for Chris as well. But, uh, yeah, yeah, for both of them. That's, a, that's quite a big game. Uh, yeah, I earlier, I think, mistakenly said, because I was confused, because early, uh, first we wanted to do Paul Dam, then because of the rain <laughs> delays, we switched to Sabo with Fritz, but because they couldn't get onto the court, uh, we switched to Paul Dam, and, and I think I earlier said that Dam was going to play Jari Draper, so sorry, guys, that's actually Sabo Wild or Fritz who's going to play Jari, uh, Jari or Draper. Mm. Uh, ooh, Nurlan with a big call here, or like a big question, would you be, put Kalinska as a top five contender for the Miami title? Um, hmm. Top 15, yes. Top 10, hmm. top 5. Hmm. I mean, Shantek <laughs> is definitely above her. Um, let me see where she's in the draw. I don't know if I would put Pegula right now above her, but where she is in the draw, I have to see because I don't even know. Um, Kaniskaya plays Ostapenko in the third round, so that kind of lowers her chances already. Like, that's yeah, top right, one right. right away. You've got Sakar Yuri Ostremska earlier. So the answer is probably no. I don't think she's quite top five. I like the course for her, sure, but I don't think she's quite top five. A bit I could draw is just a bit too tough to me. Yeah, that bit of the draw is is definitely a struggle. But if she manages to get through the next couple of rounds, then I suppose that chance goes way up. Another break point for Dennis here, he's really fighting on this sits pass serve. They've played like double the points on sits passes serve, so he's been struggling to hold the whole time. I haven't watched a ball from that much, but it sounds tragic for Stefanos. It's pretty bad, yeah. <laughs> pretty bad. He's not had a break point against uh, Shapovalov the whole time, but he's had to save eight. And obviously then conceded too. But. Yeah, a bit of a hot and cold game already from Sabre Field. That's on the first one, he just had a good serve, plus on forehand, you know, the classic play, but then a double fault. So let's see if there are some 
nerves for him right now or not well mm -hmm. if faith is not just not going to be able to keep two free balls in play then he's not going to ask the question and not he's not going to expose these nerves yeah and that's what happens here as he's um yeah just missing that forehand little shot tolerance at the moment 30 15 two points away from the match yeah whilst it sounds like Sabotch Vilch has obviously played a really good game he's he's serving so well it does feel like maybe there have been a couple of opportunities for Fritz to get back into it that he's not really taking. Yeah, kind of one, but, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, he had it, he had it, you know, he had that big return that he made there. Sure, maybe it wasn't like a put away on the next shot, but you still got to at least uh, put it into the court and yeah, in the court, yeah. see what shakes up, but kind of one opportunity. He's been a little flat, but yeah, again, it's like, also some of his limitations and mm. how as we mentioned earlier it's relatively easy to get a big win against taylor fritz compared to most other top 20 players yeah and it's it's not like shade or anything it's not really even criticism it's just it's just how it is yeah and now two match points and i'd have to do it on the second serve let's see Gets a short return from Fritz and just puts it away with the backhand. So it is a win for Thiago Sebovic. 6 3, 6 4. Oh. Round three uh, uh, from qualifying in Indian Wells, round three from qualifying in Miami. He will hope to do much better than against Marojan this time, but still yeah. massive progress. I mean, no top 20 wins on hard courts. Now he beats number 15, Kachanov, Indian Wells. He beats number 13, uh, Fritz in Miami. He scores four ATP 1000 wins, which before this month he had known. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's pretty insane, especially as you know, it doesn't seem like it right now. But like, Sabo Vit was actually about to be in some proper ranking trouble uh, after he didn't do anything in the Golden Swing. Like, he had all these challenger points coming up over the yeah. net, you know, dropping in the next three months. He was probably going to be playing on the main tour in, at that time with his form in like February, January. He didn't really make you think that he was gonna, uh, you know, be able to save them. It, it's kind of like forgotten by now, but. Coming yeah. into let's say coming into Rio, he was one and seven for the year, and right now it's just completely different. Right now he's yeah. you know suddenly in like some of the best form of his life. Definitely, really good few weeks for him. It'll be interesting to see if he can carry it on, uh, especially if his next match isn't on the big stage. Whether he can sort of bring that same motivation, but it looks like he can at the moment. I mean he's. He's playing very differently. Fifth break point in this game for Dennis. It's been going on for a very long time. He misses the return on the second serve. That wasn't great. You won't be happy with that. Back to juice again. <laughs> uh, producer is missing an action so that it doesn't even can end the stream where he when he wants. Uh, where are we in the shop of all of Tsitsipas match? Maybe if Dennis breaks, we can just you know talk about that to the to the finish or something. Yeah. Right? Whatever works for you, I'm all good. No, I mean it's fine. I think if it's if it's relatively uh, easy for Danny switch for now it is. I mean, let's see. Uh, yeah, I he's got a sixth be... break point here, so. Oh, six already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was surprised that it's the third game because I kind of remembered you talking about the you know some break points like for a while now, and I was oh, thinking, yeah. okay, so it must be like three two or something like that. No, 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 no. same game. It's been going on forever. But yeah, even even before all these breakpoints, I think you said that they were playing like double the amount of points on the City Plus serve. So. Yeah, it was before this game, I think, that it was double, so yeah. he's struggling to hold. But we're on juice number 11 now. <laughs> it's not particularly to me that City Plus is sort of saving these breakpoints. It feels more like Dennis is sort of throwing them away, but... Sitsipas has an opportunity now to hold. 
turned up in what sense? Do you mean, you know, went deep? Because, I mean, the WTA finals, for example, <laughs> or like, you know, Wimbledon, they all played it. Wimbledon, they were all in the quarters, uh, as in broad top form. Um, mm. WTA finals, sorta. I mean, I know they, they you know, Rybakin and Sabalenka had that. Hmm. Depends what you mean, I guess, by top form, because even that can be a little, but like Wimbledon, I think, could, could definitely be mentioned. Yeah. Both Rybakin and Sabalenka losing to Jaber from like a winning position. Iga playing some of her best grass tennis. Oh yeah, what we've seen so far. Yeah. And then I wasn't there in Cancun. I mean, sort of. Yeah. Pegula was just too good. <laughs> like it or not, Jessica Pegula was too good for them. She was. Oh, it's twelfth juice. <laughs> Beijing says sworn. Oh yeah, Beijing. That's a that's a fair shout as well. Um, mm -hmm. Quarterfinals, uh, Rybakina Sabalenka, or semifinals? No, quarterfinal because semifinal okay. Samsonova beats beats Rybakina. Yeah. So yeah, Beijing is a good shout too. Yeah, definitely. So it it hasn't been that long. No, I don't think so. No. I mean, yeah, sorry, uh, I didn't mention it, yeah. Because I said Avanesian's name earlier and I should have said friend of the show. <laughs> friend of the show, you got to say friend of the show. Yeah. Say 12th juice. Oh, juice, 13th juice now. Oh, that's a great return from Dennis. Why is that an advantage? Oh, was it a double bounce? Yes, sits past. Couldn't get there in time, double bounce, so... I think that's a seventh break point for Dennis Shapovalov. Maybe. No, eighth. Eighth break point. Sorry, not been keeping track, clearly. Seventeen minutes? What? Yeah. It's ridiculous. And now Sits Fast has just served another race to get himself out of trouble. And we're back to juice. I don't know, Nurland, if that would be so funny, but um, <laughs> sure. Whatever it's floats your boat. I wanted Dennis to break because then we then we would have like a very clear plan, you know, of just exactly. Yeah, he still he's he still might. Yeah, he still might. Sure. He still might. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just saw that amazing stat on my screen. Points That's they true. don't serve. Yeah, thirty-eight in the second set for uh, Steph and four for Dennis. Of course, it was two games for Steph, but still, it's still ridiculous. Oh, he's finally held serve. Yeah. Sits a pass for two-one. Maybe let's see how the set goes then. Yeah, and then we'll see out. 17 minutes and 58 seconds that game so that could really galvanize him or it might just tire him out i don't feel like he played brilliantly to to save that but who knows You go and galvanize. It could do. It could do. You know what sits pass is like. He sort of has little bits of form within matches and then it sort of goes away. So this might make him better. It depends. I think it'll depend whether he can immediately break Dennis here or not. I think he'll want to use the momentum perhaps, but not sure. A word for Andy Murray, who saved set point earlier and has taken it to a tiebreak against Echeverry. He's three love up in that tiebreak. With two breaks of serve, I think. But I'm not sure if my app's right.
Oh yeah, I missed that ghosty. Draper did take the second set. That's quite that, that's quite good from him because the first set he really did sort of, like I said earlier, freeze when he was serving for it. And he I saw that he was serving for it at 5-4 here as well. So he, he clearly did a lot better in the second set. We'll see how the third goes. Yeah, there's been quite a lot of like twists and turns in that match compared to maybe what I was expecting, you know, a yeah. more safe based affair. But all in all, it is one set all uh, over two hours already. So let's see if that is a problem for Jack. I don't think it will be a problem for Jari, but it could be for no. Jack. Yeah, and Dimari six set points up on Thomas Martinez Javeri. You think he'll climb that one in the first set? Six love up in the time league. That's quite a strong. <laughs> wow. From set point down as well. I'll be pleased with that one. Yeah. It's a very first match since that Buenos Aires quarter final against Jari, where he retired with a uh, right leg, maybe injury or something yeah. like that. But um, of course, he's recently beaten Mari twice. Basel 2023 and also was the Australian Open. Australian Basel Open. was probably longer. Than, yeah, it definitely was than the Australian Open, despite being a free, uh, best of three match. Mm. Way over three hours, whereas the Australian Open was actually kind of easy. It was quite quite simple that one. Sorry, apparently maybe the typing was um, audible <laughs> because <laughs> I couldn't hear any typing. Oh, ah, okay. Then, then I guess maybe, maybe you just saw it on the camera. Or yeah, something. <laughs> probably looking out for it. I was just tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> Tweeting on stream is a is a bit of an art. Mm. If you're doing this with someone, it's usually fine. You're gonna mm -hmm. have like enough time, but especially when you're doing a watch along by yourself and you also want to tweet out something, it's <laughs> it, it's rough. The I can imagine. Yeah, no. it's easily lost both on paper and then uh, <laughs> well, and then oh, well, not on paper, both on your screen, but also in your speech and yeah, it can get quite messy. But <laughs> I haven't tried that yet. I think I. Oh, but I to... must master that one. Yeah. How many hours approximately Iga will play? Um, let me see. There's been some revisions to the uh, order of play. I just seen the email. Hulka Shevchenko will move to court number three. But when it comes to Świątek, she will play after Vavasoli Siner. So, um, yeah, basically the time that it will take Yannick to win that match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, maybe not too long. I would say so. I'm writing a think piece about how FA is like a George A. Romero zombie fleek. <laughs> nice. Ghost is referring to my, um, was it MA or BA? MA thesis, which mm -hmm. was on horror mm -hmm. movies. And he often makes jokes about that. I actually did write, write an essay, though, on George A. Romero at some time during my uh, university <laughs> course. I can't remember what it was about, though. I mean, I know what it was about. It was definitely about Night of the Living Dead and Don't Live Night of the Living Dead and stuff. But <laughs> I don't remember what the exact point of it was. Incredible. That's really cool. Andy Murray's just won that tie break 7 love. So takes the first set. Haven't checked, but I would assume that set must have been an hour long too. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Almost 80 minutes. Yeah. That oh yes. Was, that was a given. Of course. It's actually gonna be quite interesting, yeah, then because in Basel that was kind of like how Echeverry won. Like he just straight up outlasted Murray, which doesn't yeah. happen often. It's usually Murray winning these matches. Yeah, he's normally got something left in the tank. Swarna says that he does, he or she, I don't, I don't know, doesn't think that Sabanka match, Sabanka's match will happen today. I don't think so. I think it's actually pretty possible. Like Vavasori's in there right now, that should be pretty quick. Then you have Shvantek Georgi as well. And then you just have two matches. You know, Alcaraz Carbaez Baena also won't last long mm -hmm. for, you know, yeah. most probably. So 
I think it's very possible. There could be an outside courts match that that won't happen today, mm. but um, we'll see. There's basically two courts. No, no. There's maybe two or three courts which have six matches on them. That could be really tough. I also don't know how long they can actually play in Miami and what their lighting is. By the time that happens, like by the time this is a discussion, I'm usually in bed already. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't normally see any lighting lighting discussions. Um, I'm off. I might have to stay up today, though. There's a challenger final at 3 a.m., so maybe this is when I will learn. Really? 3 a.m.? Yeah, my oh. time at least. Or yours, I think it will be two. Yeah, I don't like that about scheduling, but you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> you do. That's true. Uh, I mean, I'm very impressed if you stay up till 3 a.m. for that. But that would be a bit rich for my Well, opinion. not the first time I've done it. I've played <laughs> 100 finals, but well. Very impressive. I'm not sure what's happening in this Sinner match, by the way. I don't know if it's my app that's not working, but it's been on juice at 3 2 for eight. No, no, that's just, um, that's just how they finished yesterday. They finished mid game. That's why. Oh, and they haven't started yet. Oh, I thought they started. Yeah, started. they haven't started yet. That's me. This Sorry. is directly following up. Um, Saber I was thinking they started yesterday, but I obviously didn't realize that's when they. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, they finished Thank the you. game. So. Dennis is like really firing here. That backhand right now with the slice, just yeah. going at the target, of course. That Tsitsipas kind of gives you, and again we have a long game on the oh yeah step, on the step serve. So please don't be twenty minutes. Ghosty's right though; it's quite frustrating watching him because, in a way, Dennis is playing really well and he's doing well against Tsitsipas, but also you do feel like he could be winning this really easily if he just did a few different things. I don't know. Dennis is a very frustrating player to follow, yes. Yeah. Um, I remember thinking when he was like coming up, especially um, especially when he beat Rafa in Montreal 2017, I remember thinking that this was probably going to be like my favorite player. Mm. And no, this never really happened. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't really point you to like a specific reason, mm. uh, but despite, you know, having all the flashiness that I enjoyed, Ewan Hender as well, which I love, uh, I don't know, somehow it never really clicked. I guess probably because, yeah, he just has no B game and half the time he, he's kind of unwatchable. Yeah. I, I still like want him to do well for sure. Like that right yeah, now that he's coming yeah. back, I think he yeah, deserves to be at the top. I, I hope that with a full healthy season, he will be in the, like, you know, top 30 or something. I think yeah, I'd like still. him. Yeah. yeah, I've always liked him, but like you say, it's, it's hard to sort of really follow him and... and him become one of your your top favorites yeah there's a couple of uh Danny Shapovalo fans that i follow on twitter and they they have a bit of a painful existence so. <laughs> i can imagine when someone shoots himself in the foot this much great backhand here cross though he has another break point yeah <sighs> I wonder if that Tsitsipas serve is like, mm. you know, at the top of his potential speed as well. I don't know. Just seems to me like he's kind of. Yeah, well, it doesn't look great. Now on the speed gun, I saw that it was like 116 on that previous one. I guess mm. that's not. Well, it's a little lower, but maybe because of the way it was angled, it's okay. Yeah. I don't know. Do we have these stats somewhere on the AT website? I will have to check. But... <laughs> He's had some issues with it recently, and maybe that's why I'm just sort of looking out for it. Yeah, it's definitely been inconsistent in this match, his serve, because at times it's not looked great, but then he has also used it to get out of quite a lot of the break points that Dennis has had. So, mm. yeah, with the, with the with the how many break points he saved? 13. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's likely that some of them were thanks to his serve. Yeah, a good amount of them were either unreturned serves or aces. So. But he holds quite quickly there, not another ridiculously long. Yeah, apparently the ATP stats are useless because they tell me that the first serve average speed for 
Tsitsipas is like over 230 kilometers, that's impossible. But actually his max speed is like 20 kilometers lower. So I guess the max I can probably believe, but not the average. Um, no, it doesn't. The that's max right. sounds so like it, it should be like usual. But yeah, again, average would tell us more. But the 80 yeah. stats apparently are not helpful in this case. <laughs> so, as usual. Although first set, they seem to be working OK. And it was about 200. Just like for Shapo. So, yeah, and I think it's fine. I, mm -hmm. I don't think he's been that on stair speeds then. No. Maybe it was just a couple of random ones that caught my attention, especially with his recent uh, switch from I know, the, the, the surf stance and stuff, and how yeah. he's, some of the injuries that he's had have also impacted it. Oh, we have that one chatter who always comes in and um, just says that Guy and Monfils will win the title. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I've been here before with uh, the Monfils fan, as I know, uh, when we were watching a Monfils Indian Wells oh, game. Right. Um, he lost, so it was quite sad. I felt quite bad for you, but I hope you've bounced back uh, since the loss. He, he is looking good in Miami, so I don't know if he's yeah, looking good. Like he's playing today, but it was like something I thought he was going to win. Who was it? Oh, Jordan Thompson. So it's like kind of tough, but um, I do think Gal has a good chance. Yeah, I would. I would back Monfils in that. Yeah. Thompson did trash him in Indian Wells last year, but I think that was Gal's first match after the, the injury. So yeah. he definitely wasn't at the top of his game yet. No, he's looked quite strong more recently, I think. Or a lot yeah. stronger. Last month or so. I mean, 37 years old and still running yeah. around the court like a gazelle. <laughs> gazelle, I like that. That's very him. That's very interesting that Dennis was glorious in that Wimbledon semi-final against Djokovic. I mean, it was, he, he lost in the straights, you know. <laughs> but at least one set, he did have a good chance, I, I think. The second one, maybe. So. Yeah. Although it, it, it is still a bit of a weird choice to like talk about the, the best Shapovalov match. And <laughs> glorious is a strong loss. word, yeah. <laughs> glorious person. Glorious. Person. He was definitely really good at that event, although I think there was still like a, a five-setter at the beginning of the event that just kind of showed you why it's so tough for Dennis to get on a big Grand Slam run, because he's always going to have that one weak performance throughout the week, and it's tough yeah. to survive it. Yeah, but if he does survive it, he's probably going to do a bit yeah. of a run, but it is, it, it, it's so hit and miss with it, so... <laughs> It would also be kind of sad to say that his best performance was against Nadal in 2017 because, well, he was so raw and stuff, but yeah. maybe it kind of was. So it's, <laughs> he's a fun, fun player to analyze, definitely. As oh, we yeah. Said, you're not a fun player to maybe like follow religiously. <laughs> no, but it's, there's a lot to talk about with him, I think. You can, yeah. There's a lot of aspects of his game that are interesting, at least. He's always interesting. Yeah, that's that's. I think that's the main thing about him. Yeah, for better or worse. Erlan <laughs> <laughs> is asking if you're a fan of Katie Volinets. Katie Volinets. Um, fan might be a bit strong, but I enjoy watching her play. I don't know if that's going to be enough for you for me to say I'm not a fan. I'm. I wouldn't say like you know I, I'm not a big big follower of of Katie Volinets, but I I do enjoy her her game especially because i think she's still getting better all the time um tough match against paulini earlier but um she made it close you know seven six seven five so i think that's quite a decent performance against paulini Thirty all here on uh, Dennis's serve, so possibly a chance for sits a pass here.
this was like a long game, I guess, on the shop of Olive Surf by this much by this much standards. By this much standards, it was a long game, but he's he's held it quite easily from 30 all. It didn't take him long after that to sort of get in gear. So his service games are just so much shorter than six passes that it does feel like a bit of a matter of time, but depends if he can get better on serve, I suppose. Someone else earlier was asking about Mikkelsen. He's now down a break in the fifth, in the third set against Higgspor. Sounds like a super tight match. Haven't watched the ball from it, but Talon serving for a 5-3 lead now. Yeah, and now we also have some points one on return. So basically, Steph is on like 9 out of 38, and Shapovalov is like almost 50%, even 40 out of 88 so it's a, it's a pretty brutal uh, match so far for Tsitsipas, even if he's on serve in the second set. And maybe yeah. this will be like a classic shop of all of loss, you know? It would be oh. the most easy thing to do, right, to lose this. Oh, it would be. I feel so bad if he lost this from here. I don't know how he could lose this from here. He's had this one uh, recently against Mari, of course, when we talked mm -hmm. about where, like Andy hit like what nine winners maybe in shop of all forty. It's it's similar to the or maybe it was eight to forty. It was similar to mm -hmm. Nava Bautista Good um this week, where I think Bautista Good had maybe eight winners, Nava had forty seven and mm -hmm. he lost in straights. <sighs> well, of course winners aren't everything, but like yeah, no, but it kinda tells you that one player was in control of the proceedings and absolutely the other was kind of there <laughs> and still won <laughs> once more backhand winner from uh dennis just as you say that for 1530 once more Know. I've said a lot of things, Ghosty. I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> ah, Mickelson, maybe, yeah, because he says Mickelson now. I think or, it might have been about Shafavala from yeah. here. Or maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Who knows? So many, <laughs> could have been so many things. Especially in these early days of the event, we were sort of jumping between matches, maybe not necessarily watching, but talking about all these players so yeah i mean there's so many matches i'd like to watch this evening it's ridiculous it's annoying i can't yeah. watch them all to be honest but... and they start you know pretty late in the day as well exactly. so see yes. how it goes Sinner already on court and already serving for the set against vavasori so nurlan might get his wish and see the schwantek <laughs> play sometime soon yeah, I, I definitely want to see Shank Davidovich Fokina if I still can after this one, but we'll see. Jerry has to make it work so that I can and you know maybe not win the second set, but at least be competitive in it. And yeah, the Jerry Draper one as well. That was one that I thought that I was gonna watch, but mm. it's like not really. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to in these stages, especially when you have a full de day practically of rain delays, there's always going to be a day where there's just too much tennis for you to watch. <laughs> Lawn ping pong. Love that. John told me you're particularly good at table tennis. I think uh, I'm particularly good, I wouldn't say maybe, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I play a bit. Mm. Same say. here. Um, it's it's hard to like, you know, of course, say how good you are. I'm definitely not like, you know, a pro in any sense of the word. <laughs> I did play for like my university for five years. But yeah. I guess that's something. We're not the strongest team, definitely not. <laughs> but, Still um, a uni team, it counts. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now I kind of just am scared that my coach is going to call me and tell me to give them back the track suits that we had. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm wearing it a lot. Um, on the... On the um, um, sort of on the jumper, the, the, it actually says the name of the university. So that I'm not using, but the, the trousers, you know, they're, they're great. So <laughs> I really want to keep them. 
hopefully they're not gonna call me but <laughs> fingers crossed yeah to, to be fair i used to play, i t played table tennis for a, a lot of years but i don't really anymore um and um the track suits are really comfy i don't know what it is about table tennis track suits but i always i've got like three somewhere from my from my they probably don't i don't know ours were actually sort of uh bought from a company that produces uh, things for handball so oh. they're actually handball but we use them for their table tennis oh brilliant but, you know, it doesn't, you know, what, what difference does this make but um <laughs> but yeah I'm, i mean I, I play a bit like right now i play twice a week about an hour and a half each Oh, so nice. It's, you know, it's nothing extreme. Of course, I'm not going to be a pro, but I I can enjoy it and I can still get better, probably. Yeah. No, I'm. If I picked up a bat now, I'm pretty sure I'd be rubbish. But I used I used to be <laughs> reasonable. I think. Yeah, I, 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 John John knows because I did play him, although uh, you know, he was just like an, a recreational player. Yes, so. yeah, he did mention <laughs> Yeah, I, play, I played with his friends, um, so of course it wasn't too tough, but we still had fun. We played some yeah. doubles as well, and oh, uh, it nice. wasn't even, like, it wasn't even me winning these matches. Like, whoever I was playing with suddenly became, like, Timo Bolo. <laughs> Amazing. But yeah, it was pretty fun. They were all drinking beers as well. Uh, maybe I was too. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't remember, maybe you, maybe you were. I probably was. I probably was. Yeah, I'm kind of afraid for Shapovalov already, you know? When 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 I see this sort of scoreline after all these breakpoints, like it's I just know. it rings a bell. It, it rings a bell. It's uh, it's it's making me quite nervous actually. Yeah, and and it's like you know we mentioned earlier that this could be a pretty rough uh, win for rough loss for Steph confidence wise, but also for Dennis. Like if he loses yeah. like that again after recently having that match with. Uh, with Mari, was it also like Musetti that he played recently and had a big chance to win, didn't take it. Of course, Darderi round one here, it was also a mess. For him, it's also like just as crucial to take it as for Tsitsipas. This is yeah. you know crucial to, to survive, at least make it more competitive. You know, yeah, he is for all in the second set, but just a second ago, I had the baseline points one stat on my screen. It was like 46 22 Shapovalov. That's a ridiculous advantage. It is. Oh, it's making me nervous. Don't think the chat wants us to talk about him losing. <laughs> <laughs> We're just stating facts, though. It's just talking about previous previous form. No jinxing here. Too much points from Taron Krikspar, so Mikkelsen almost out of the tournament. Draper up a break as well, but it's still very early in the first set. Yeah. Just early days to get a break. Right Might struggle to hold that. No, just two women's matches right now, so I guess there will be a lot more coming and sort of late at night? Well, not really. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we have a lot of men's matches that are com yet to be completed, but not really on the women's side. But yeah, Timofey Vanoskova and Stevens Kista, Kista serving for the match, 6 2 five, one. You're gonna like that first serve from Cincy Pass in a second. Okay. It's kind of funny because, of course, you know, in tennis, <laughs> you serve. Yeah, you, you, you're supposed to serve into the other box, right? And he just kind of stood there and served like straight in front. Like it, it was a great line, it, actually. Like if, if you were supposed to serve, just you know, straight up, right and ahead. It would have been, it it would have been great. Line. Yeah, like it was like hundred percent. In the line, mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, that's not really the goal. 
he didn't even react to it at all. He just kind of went on to his second serve. Well, that's good. You know, he probably shouldn't react to it. I no, suppose. I suppose not. I'm, I'm probably used to him reacting to stuff like that, but I suppose better not to. The parents are reacting quite vividly in his box. Of course, that's also mm -hmm. uh, a bit of a topic over the years, like whether yeah. the influence of them is good for him and like how much they still matter for his career. Oh, yeah. Pretty tough to say. Yeah. I mean, he's tried other coaches, hasn't he? And, and it's not worked, so. Yeah, but they like the father was still involved, right? Exactly. Yeah. I think if you're going to try another coach, I think you should probably really switch and, and make a go of it for maybe a bit longer as well than he did, to be honest. But Yeah, some of the issues that like with Filipusis that he had, I think that's, this was also like the fact that Apostolos Tsitsipas and Filipusis weren't getting along. Yeah, yeah, probably. I can imagine. One, one more break point, Shapovalov. How desperate is it? How desperate is it getting? I think he really, oh, I don't know. I think he needs to break soon just for my own nerves. Oh, and he has. Yeah, kept two free shots in play and Tsitsipas eventually made the error. I mean, it's yeah. tragic. I mean, he didn't, he didn't have to do anything spectacular, did he? Yeah, it, it, it is a pretty tragic Tsitsipas performance. Like, regardless of Dennis, of course, I mean, he's getting back into his rhythm and stuff. He's been okay here. He hit a few spectacular shots for sure, but like, for Tsitsipas to be outplayed off the baseline by so much and also, yeah, just constantly in trouble on serve. It's rough. Yeah, it's a tough watch for Tsitsipas fans, I imagine. But it's all right, because Ghosty's loving it. <laughs> I'm the same. I'm happy for Dennis here. He's, uh, he's playing well. Yeah, I was expecting more from him already in the last few weeks. Of course, the losses to Mari Musetti, he was fully able to like win these matches. You know, he had he had his chances there. Yeah. And um, well, it was pretty rough for him that he didn't, but this will help. And I think earlier I said this, he would play play uh, Saberfield in the third round. So yeah, can kind of hard to say who's the favorite if that. No, Sabovic plays Jari Draper. What am I talking about? No, I was going to say, that feels mixed up. <laughs> I keep forgetting. So who is Shapovalov playing potentially if he beats Set City Pass? Yeah. Uh, where is he in the draw? Jesus, I can't find him now. Uh, I don't know. He would play Bublik or Arnaldi. Yeah, nothing easy then. No. So similarly, I guess to say, it would be hard to pick a favorite between Shapo and Arnaldi, Bublik, Shapovalov. I seem to think that maybe Bublik has like a couple of previous wins. I'm checking that now. Yeah, three and zero. Uh, but oh yeah, that's why I remember this match because it actually happened this year already. Of course, Montpellier round two and Bublik saved three match points against Shapovalov, won and then won the event. That was that famous win where every single match he won from a set down. <laughs> That's why this match have sounded familiar. So it's three um, wins for Bublik, zero for Shapo, but it was always three sets. And, you know, he had three match points in all, but yeah. So uh, I guess either way, he will have his chances if he indeed pushes through. Yeah, it's a, de it's a decent draw for him. He could give that one a go. I, I, there's Most of them are going to be tough draws for him going forward. So that's probably one of the better ones he could have, I suppose. He's 30 love up, so looking confident in his service game as he serves for the match. I wasn't sure whether we'd see nerves or not, but. Three match points for Dennis. Takes the first one. Yeah, no, no fuss about it this time. Like this time, he just absolutely cleans it up. And I guess just like every game in this match, I mean, 
I, every service game, every service, every game, yeah. How many points did he lose on serum? I mean, I would assume it's like probably ten. It know, can't be very many. Yeah, it's it's precisely ten. Um, oh, you know, gosh. I did cheat a bit. I did cheat a bit. Like <laughs> I, I, I checked it like five games ago, so I, I more or less had an idea of how many it would be. But still, I was go I was gonna be really. You shouldn't have said you checked it. I was gonna be really, really impressed there. No, uh, it's uh, yeah, I did, but. And just 54% for Stefanos, yeah, 50, 55 out of 101. I mean, probably the most comfortable 6-2-6-4 you can get. Like, it, it, it's yeah. very easier than that with that sort of scoreline. Definitely. I would say even, I usually say stuff like, oh, that scoreline didn't really portray it like it was a much more difficult match. But I think this is one of the first matches I can think of where actually it was way easier than the scoreline suggests even. It was really kind of smooth sailing for... Dennis today. Yeah, so um, let's maybe sort of, you know, start wrapping up the stream, but like mm. recently we've been talking about Sissipas, you know, his issues and like how he's not really relevant in terms of like contender for big titles anymore, but it doesn't feel like he was still like producing efforts like this. Like he, he kind of didn't have any random losses. He was losing either to top 20 players or like very talented young guys. Of course, Shapoval is like in a way you know, a former top 20 player, very talented young guy still as well. But mm. is it like something new for Tsitsipas, this this match, this effort, how far he was of Dennis? For me, yeah, definitely. Um I think it's I think it's a new a new level of of sort of not being even competitive. Obviously he's had those losses, like you say, but mostly to players that you sort of felt beforehand probably could beat Tsitsipas. A bit a bit like Fritz in terms of people are able to get those wins against sits pass sometimes maybe more easily than other top 10 players but i think this this was new because he didn't feel like he was really competing today obviously i'm not blaming his effort level but just his his ability to compete with dennis today wasn't quite there yeah i, I do think it's a bit new like it it might be similar to um the hedge loss in a way because you've mm. got uh, two, well, I think it's the same scoreline really as well, uh, or maybe uh, the other way around, maybe 6 4 six, two. But not, that's not what I'm mentioning with this. But um, in the Lehechka one, I think someone in our talking tennis group chat on WhatsApp or something mentioned that like Lehechka is absolutely peaking. And then maybe it was John who said, but does he really need to peak to, to beat Tsitsipas? And well, the answer was probably not at the moment. And here we also didn't really see, like, you know, it's a pretty decent effort from Shabovalov, of course, but, like, it wasn't that he was extraordinary. And I guess it was pretty similar in these two matches that even if the the opponent just kind of dropped off a little bit, they would still have a big edge. Like, they didn't really need to, I don't know, just um, go red line and just paint the lines all the time. No, no. To beat Tsitsipas. It was just, like, an edge big enough that they could do it with a mediocre, well, not a mediocre, but, like, yeah, with an okay performance. Yeah. So, with mistakes, um, I think it's important to mention that Dennis was making mistakes. He was curling forehands wide and, and, and stuff quite regularly um, and had lots of break points that he didn't take advantage of. So it wasn't as if, yeah, like you say, it wasn't a really, really clean performance from Shapovalov, but it didn't really need to be. Yeah, so a, a big one for Chapo. Lots of worrying signs for Tsitsipas as, a, as we are entering the clay season, where, of course, as usual, he's defending a ton of points. It's kind of like the most important uh, part of the season for him, as, as usual, but like especially this year when he has Monte Carlo quarterfinal, Barcelona final, Madrid quarterfinal, Rome semi, French Open quarterfinal. So basically for the five big events on clay, probably not going to play anything else. For the five, for these five events, I mean, every single time he kind of needs to make the quarterfinals at least to keep yeah. himself in like a ranking that would be at least a bit reflective of his ability. Sunshine double, he actually had a shot to like maybe regain some points, but he doesn't because last year he went out in the second round in Indian Wells and fourth round in Miami. So I guess now he swapped it. Yeah. So yeah. And. Um, Things are looking pretty bleak, especially after today. And Shapovalov will not play Jari Draper, but will play uh, <laughs> Bublikor and Maldi, yes. yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I think we can finish in that. Uh, we actually gave you three matches in one uh, stream yeah. eventually. Whoa. <laughs> 
you guys can consider yourself lucky. Uh, <laughs> we were already saying bye in the chat as well. Um, so they knew that we were coming to close. Thank you, Kira. It was great to meet you. Um, you like to learn how to pronounce your name. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're going to see each other on some other watch alongs in the future. I'm sure. And, uh, thank you guys again in the chat. And uh, yeah, just bye.